to this afternoon's um, sitting of the ERA Committee. And there's a briefing paper from um, RCN Rail Action and NIRWG at pages 234 to 240 in your packs, and a paper from the Middle Australia Lag at pages 42 to 49 of the table of papers. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you here to the, the meeting this morning, uh, Aidan, Theresa, Louise and Connor. Uh, it's good to see you up here, so it is. Um, I've had various engagements with you over the last number of years, so it's good to see you up here before the committee to give some uh, evidence in relation to the Agriculture Bill. Um, I uh, want to advise representatives that you have 15 minutes to brief the committee, brief the committee and then there will be some questioning after about 15 minutes. And, um, Okay, so listen, whoever wants to kick off, go ahead. Uh, thanks very much, Chair, and thanks to the Chair and to the members for inviting us up today. Um, a few uh, words of background on our three organisations in your pack, so I'm not going into that, but I'll basically say a wee bit about our um, sort of expertise on why we're here. Um, first of all, I suppose is to welcome the invitation to submit evidence to the committee on the Agriculture Bill. Um, RCN Rural Action and Irwin all have a keen interest in rural communities and rural development. RCN and Irwin sit on the Rural Development Programme Monitoring Committee and staff of Rural Action, formerly employed by the Rural Development Council, had previous representation on the Monarch Committee, managed the Northern Ireland Rural Network contract, which was a network and structure for the local action groups delivering the leader measures of the Rural Development Programme in Northern Ireland, and RDC was previously a delivery agent for the programme. So I'm going to make some open comments on behalf of the three organisations, and then Theresa and Louise are going to make a few additional points. Um, before we hand over then to Connor um, from Middles or Lag, um, and then we'll open, I suppose, open up to questions. Um, most of our comments are going to relate to Schedule 6 of the Bill, which relates to Northern Ireland. So, firstly, we support the need to retain the basic payment scheme in Northern Ireland. This will provide continuity for farmers and landowners until the Minister, the Executive, and the Assembly agree how payments to farmers uh, need to change. This gives breathing space to consider the issues and how the public money for public goods principle will apply to the diverse range of farms across Northern Ireland. We believe direct payments are vital to sustaining small farms and make a big contribution to the economy in rural areas, where money is spent locally by farmers and helps sustain a wide range of rural business. We believe it is vitally important that Northern Ireland develops a future rural development programme and that any future programme meets the needs of rural communities here. These are devolved issues and must be deliberated and agreed with the Minister, the Executive and the Assembly now that the evolution is functioning. In our view, it is vitally important that we consider how rural development will be facilitated post-Brexit, and we would welcome time for that deliberation on how rural development policy and delivery can best meet the needs of rural communities. In relation to the future rural development, we would make the following general points for committee members' consideration. Rural development should remain a priority across Northern Ireland. This aligns, we think, with the top priority of the Executive to develop a reasonably balanced economy. Rural development support may become even more important as farming evolves to meet ongoing environmental challenges and the need for farm diversification grows. Leaving the EU gives us the opportunity to better align agriculture, environment and rural development policy outside of the two-pillar model of the CAP. Despite the challenges with EU funding and bureaucracy, the Rural Development Programme in Northern Ireland has made a significant contribution to rural communities, to farming and to the environment. We know, for example, that under the current Rural Business Investment Scheme, over 450 businesses have been supported. A broad-based community infrastructure has been developed right across rural Northern Ireland is having a significant impact on a wide range of issues that improve the quality of life for citizens, and that needs to be invested in and built upon. We recognise there are ongoing challenges in rural communities, um, however we also believe there are big opportunities as well. So just over a third of our population lives in a rural community. The population of rural areas is growing faster than that of urban. And between 2001 and 2017, rural populations here grew by 18% in comparison to 6% for urban areas. Many rural communities host a range of thriving and innovative small and medium enterprises. Micro and small businesses are particularly important and 94% uh, of rural businesses are considered to be micro, which employs less than 10 people. These enterprises are an important part of the rural fabric, contributing to a living, working countryside. Farming will continue to evolve, but will hopefully still produce quality food, which can command a fair price for the producer and in a way that will protect and enhance the environment. 
Women have always played a key role in the development and sustainability of rural areas. In times of change in agriculture and rural communities, the work, innovations and entrepreneurial achievements of rural women is central to the future progress and viability of rural areas. As we've already stated, the future objectives of rural development in Northern Ireland and the policies and mechanisms that deliver them will be agreed by the Minister, the Executive and the Assembly. However, we believe it's vitally important that the views of stakeholders, especially those in rural communities, are considered in line with the principles of co-design and co-production agreed by the parties as part of the new decade, new approach priorities. A further question that should be considered by the committee is how provisions in the UK Agriculture Bill will interact with proposals for a UK Shared Prosperity Fund and the work that DERA has already begun on a rural development policy framework. <coughs> Our understanding from a workshop for rural stakeholders held in Belfast in January last year is that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund will be the mechanism used to replace all EU structural funds and that will include a strand for rural development. As far as we are aware, no details of the operation of the Shared Prosperity Fund have been agreed, but it was discussed in a House of Commons debate on 5th of September 2019. We are concerned that no policy proposals for the Shared Prosperity Fund have been put forward by the UK Government, as these will shape the nature of rural development across the UK. Furthermore, we are also concerned that from discussions at that engagement event, that there may be no ring fence funding element for rural development within that fund. I'm going to hand over now to Theresa to make a few more comments. Okay, thanks, Aidan. Um, and thank you to the Chair and members of the Committee for this um, kind invitation to be here today. Um, I suppose I just want to add a couple of um, comments in, uh, in relation to what Aidan said about the future of the Rural Development Programme and, and Rural Development Policy. I suppose it's in relation to the fact that members will be aware that we recently um, facilitated some discussions with stakeholders in an event in Lockery um, in January, and indeed I know some of you were there at that event. So um, just to say, this was on behalf of DERA, um, and we very much welcome this approach to engage with stakeholders at this early point, um, and we commend the Department for engaging um, stakeholders through a series of working groups um, and at this event. Um, and I just want to highlight to the committee the clear need that is emerging through these discussions and around this engagement about the requirement for a future rural development programme. Um, and I suppose I would expect that you would know that we would say this, but it's just to highlight that this is also coming from stakeholders at that event, and as I say, some of you were already there. Um, rural development, as you know, covers a wide breadth of activities, um, focusing on the rural economy, enterprise and entrepreneurship, it's about jobs, employment, health and wellbeing, uh, address and isolation, access to services, it's about connectivity, um, it's about villages. So it's about a whole host of things, and essentially it's about people and places, it's about individuals, communities, farmers, farm families, and everybody involved in the countryside. So I suppose we need to ensure that um, you know, farming is doing well. So if farming is doing well, we believe that um, you know, there's a need for continued support there. But equally, we need rural society to be doing well. Um, and that's why we would call for an agreed rural policy and rural framework um, for Northern Ireland. Um, I suppose if we are to collectively deliver on the vision of a living, working, active landscape for all, then we need policies that work for agriculture, for environment and for rural society. And they should be complementary. Um, I suppose, like Aidan has said, um, we see an opportunity now to align these policies um, closer and to make them more relevant to the needs of rural communities here. Uh, I suppose it would seem to me in reading the Agricultural Bill um, that the schedule gives or makes provision to extend the EU legislation to run out the current leader programme. Um, and I suppose it raises the question around um, what is needed um, going forward in terms of a new programme. Uh, we would seek agreement for guaranteed funding for rural development and call for this to be ring-fenced in line with previous programmes. Um, and we also think it's important that there's no gap between, between the programmes. Um, so I suppose just in, in support of what Aidan has said, we would uh, be keen to support the committee, the Minister uh, and Dara in taking forward this work and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Okay, I guess moving to me. <laughs> yeah. um, Nerwin and um, the Rural Women's Network support everything that Aidan and Teresa has just shared with you, but I suppose from our point of view, our membership is rural women, and the success of programmes in the past of rural development have not managed to target women in the way that they want, and the evaluations of those um, <coughs> programmes state that very clearly. So I suppose we would see that this is maybe potentially an opportunity, actually, for, um, for us to lead the way and do something, do it differently, but that needs to be done at the design end, counting it at the end when the programme's already happened, as we have already found, is, is consistently proven not to work. Um, 
And I think um, DERA have been a really great department in that respect in terms of gender equality. They've got really excellent targets internally and externally and through the legs structure had really made an effort to try and get 50-50 gender balance there. But it, because of the design of the programme, it wasn't really filtering down to women being the beneficiaries. And I would say young people as well, although um, women are, are, are um, focus. So I suppose I put that out there that there's an opportunity as well as all of the, the problems <laughs> that, that we are clearly facing into ha leaving the EU and our members are, are really very clear that you know rural communities are liable to suffer as a, a result of, of leaving the EU and they're very worried and I suppose the Rural Development Programme is one of those things that, that has supported vibrant rural, rural society and, and we're dependent now on that coming from the UK and we need a devolved voice in there because our rural communities are not the same as rural communities in other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, we would share, the, uh, I know Aidan did outline it very clearly, about that UK Shared Prosperity Fund. We were all at, at that meeting and it was very clear that day anyway that they hadn't even really considered rural development, never mind rural development in a Northern Ireland context. I mean, they had very, they looked kind of shocked that we were all interested in asking questions about that. So that, that was certainly a red flag to us. So um, that's it really. Uh, and thank you all for your time and inviting us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Connor Core from uh, the local action groups, the uh, delivery of the rural development programme. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, uh, thank you all for inviting us along to, to submit orally. Uh, as you know, we have already submitted a, a, a short written paper, which I want to summarise quite quickly. First of all, I'd like to concur with everything that has been said from um, Aidan, Louise, and Theresa from their three organisations, and we fully support their submission. Uh, I'd like to focus in on the rural development uh, programme delivery as part and parcel of, the, of our com commentary on the UK uh, Government Agriculture Bill. So the 10 local action groups, uh, known as the priority leader groups or LAGs, uh, are made up of local government, as, and as you probably all know, made up of local government and social partners, of which, one, of, of, of which I am one. Uh, all 10 local groups are established as independent companies and are coterminous with the 10 local uh, rural councils and each with a service level agreement with DERA uh, through the local councils in terms of financial management, etc. So just in terms of where we're at today, presently there are 216 LAG board members, 116 of those being from social partners, 100 elected representatives also work uh, uh, alongside. The members have a keen interest in rural communities, rural development, and have invested over this programme many thousands of hours, voluntary hours, into working with the department um, in delivering the programme. And this has included assessing over 1,400 applications, representation on various bodies such as the NI Rural Development Programme Monitoring Committee, the Leader Strategic Forum Network Subgroups Oversight Committees, etc. So, later being the European Community Initiative for assisting rural communities in, in improving the quality of life and economic prosperity uh, is the delivery mechanism through which £70 million has been allocated to the NIRDP over 2014 and 2020, and which has been spent at the sub-regional level across the lags um, within a local rural development strategy. And included, included within the £70 million, there has been £12.4 million spent for, uh, on council administration to support the 10 lags in the 10 rural areas. So the aim of the leader approach is to increase the capacity of local rural community, business, business networks and local representatives together to build knowledges, skills, innovation and also in cooperation in order to tackle rural development objectives. And this has been a very successful approach adopted over this last by, by successive NI governments over this last 25 years and has been a prime agent in ensuring a thriving and increasingly rural cohesive area. So I'm not going to go into the general principles in, in detail, but serving a defined rural area, networking, etc., would, would be exa examples of some of the principles that are endeared within the programme. So the rural development schemes are made up of the rural business schemes, they're made up of rural services, uh, basic services, a, a rural broadband scheme, and village renewal scheme. And in terms of our commentary on the, on the UK Government Agriculture Bill, we welcome this invitation. What we'd like to say as a result of our experiences over this last programme and previous programmes, our participation and cooperation with DERA and previously with DART in successfully delivering the rural development programme since as far back as 1992, we believe that there's a need to develop further 
rural development programme within a specific framework which meets the needs of the rural population and delivered using a leader type approach. So we support the Bill's intention to provide powers to an NI uh, Dara Minister in relation to agricultural policy and to modify existing EU legislation on rural development. And we ask for the record that this would include the delegation of power to include a new rural development programme as an outcome of the new rural policy framework for NI. So the UK Government Agriculture Bill provides an opportunity for, devol for devolved government to design and deliver policy, and we would ask that this now be prioritised by Minister Poots and the Executive under dev devolution to develop and implement seamlessly a rural development programme post-2020. It's our view that it is vitally important that the ex NI Executive considers how rural development will be facilitated and also funded post-2020 and Brexit and uses whatever powers are contained within the bill to develop a programme or such a programme. And would we, we would welcome an initiative, uh, sorry, an, an indicative uh, schedule and times table on current deliberations on how rural development policy and delivery will best meet the needs of our rural communities. And we would concur, as, as Aidan has said, that this is important, that the views of the rural stakeholders are included, uh, that there continue to be included as exemplified by the, 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 the workshops that uh, Theresa referred to, um, underway currently by DERA as, as part and parcel of the Rural Development Framework. So we would welcome further opportunity to cooperate in this valuable work. Uh, it's also important that the Executive requires of the UK Government that pro policy proposals for the shaping of the nature of rural development across the UK be adopted in a timely fashion through delegation of powers under this bill or alternative mechanisms such as the UK SPF, and which specifically could include a new rural development programme. Uh, within my submission, you will find a number of um, highlights in relation to, for example, the rural development programme delivery to date. Uh, I'm not going into detail, but it talks about how many op letters of offer, etc., have been issued to date, um, the, 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 the spread of, of, of spend, and also then an example in Mid Ulster. And I just refer to Mid Ulster specifically. There's been a total investment of 16 million generated from a leader funding allocation of 8.3 million generated from the private, private, the community voluntary, and also the council sectors, and that's just across Mid Ulster. 95 rural-based SMEs have been supported uh, in business and, and business development and expansion activities, which will lead to a total investment of 7.2 million. Of those 95. Over 900 employees are currently employed, and as a result of investment, 230 additional new jobs, with 135 created to date alone in Mid Ulster. This is just a flavour of what the Rural Development Programme has has done, and I thank you for listening. And thank you. Hmm. Well, thank you very much for that um, insight, and for if he's making an effort to provide it to the briefing paper and for coming up here today. And, Conscious that you, like myself, you don't live on, in Belfast or on the skirts of Belfast, so you've travelled some distance of a year. So I'm very, very appreciative of that. There, I suppose um, uh, we have a number of people who wish to ask questions, but maybe just to I can start off. Um, Louise, you mentioned about uh, the issue of isolation, um, and I know that from certainly from the first meeting that I had with the minister. Uh, the issue of rural isolation and mental health is something which both he and indeed myself and without the committee uh, see as priorities. How would you envisage whereby the, rural, the support from the Rural Development Programme has targeted isolation or created opportunities to address issues of isolation in, in rural areas? I think there's no doubt when there's that amount of spend that it has done that, but I'm not sure that that was ever the focus of, mm. of any of the strands, of the, even when it was Access 3 previously and, and now Priority 6. Yeah. Um, there have been initiatives, I'm sure, that, that had that at their core, and anything that's engaged in rural people is addressed in social isolation. But in comparison to the likes of the Tripsy program, mm. you know, which is very clearly um, trying mm. to, to tackle those things, I would say is probably a better model if that's mm -hmm. where you're at from the outset. Thinking, and I suppose that was kind of what I was saying that you know there's something some thinking to be done in the design of the kind of program we want to create, the kind of rural communities that we want, um, and there's an opportunity, I suppose, in the future to do something a bit 
better do mm -hmm. it better. I mean, I don't think it's acceptable that you know women continue to be a, a target underrepresented mm -hmm. group. To keep pointing it out is is you know pointless really, unless you have some um, you take some um, initiatives to, to address that. And I don't think maybe there was. There could have been things done better, but still, I don't think there was really the flexibility, and I also don't think it was the is, was the main thrust of of the rural development program initiative mm -hmm. in, in its in its design. Um, I don't know if anybody else. Uh, please. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Louise yeah. refers to uh, the Tripsy program. Within that program, there were most mm. definitively yeah. uh, programs that were that were targeted at, at isolation and, and, and social social inclusion uh, for example um, there there is currently being delivered a social prescribing scheme yeah. through yeah. through DERA. there was a former mara scheme which was about inviting people into uh, to ensure that their benefits etc were 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 uh, in inclusive those were across rural areas and could into very small pockets of rural deprivation uh, there's been support for rural support family Farms, etc., and, and a very strong community development infrastructure support. Uh, that program has more or less uh, definitively been targeting social inclusion and, and, and obviously tackling isolation rather than the priority six. But there, as yeah. Louise and Theresa says, there's now an opportunity to ensure that. Um, these sorts of issues that we all know are, that exist in rural areas are brought into the fold within within overall the overall delivery. And in small amounts of money in comparison to the rural development <coughs> funding that's been coming in, yeah. like you you all know this, like Tripsy is a tiny, mm. small budget com in comparison, but yet the impact that it's having is yeah. is huge, particularly in levering in extra money from even other departments and, and other yeah. things. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to add. Um, obviously, there is the access to services. Uh, measure within um, Priority 6 and, and also Village Regeneration and they have, I suppose, contributed to a lot of facilities and yeah. community buildings yeah. sure. um, which obviously uh, address um, isolation but I mean I would concur that we have an opportunity now to do things differently and to look at the best practice that Tripsy has presented and to look at the best practice under the Rural Development Programme um, and combine those and do something you know, great for, for rural Northern Ireland. And you see, um, before we move on, you see within the bill here, there is opportunity for creating such a successor programme. Um, and within government, there is a lot of emphasis around the uh, principles of co-production and co-design. Would you believe, do you believe that the leader uh, methodology enshrines that there? And is that something that you'd like to see continuing in a successor to the Priority 6 programme? Well, yeah, well, I suppose absolutely. <laughs> I, better, I, I better take that. Absolutely, the leader approach is a bit of bottom-up approach, and it's about local people knowing uh, within a, a defined strategic um, a, a objective what the local needs are and, and addressing those at a, at a local level through local plans. Um, so yes, the approach is, 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 is most certainly something that has proved uh, valuable and something that has proved very very useful in the past. As I say, I, I referred to uh, at the start of my submission that I was one representative of 216 uh, representatives of 116 of them which are social. All those mm -hmm. uh, thousands of hours of voluntary uh, com commitment to the programme um, are, are, are part and parcel of, it, the bot of, of demonstrating the, the bottom-up approach. Um, and yes, it has worked. It's much, much um, more effective and more efficient than a top-down or a, a you know a, a blow-in approach. Can I just add to that that particularly in this current programme, it has been very challenging to get enough women and enough young people onto those um, local action groups. And I, you know, you will all know it, it's the technicality of sometimes the discussion and a lot of that comes from the EU um, stuff um, it's very legalistic and it's very um, and it's very off-putting if it's your first meeting and in, in the previous round we uh, we did as an urban did a, a lot of work with women getting them ready for the local action groups and we did some mentoring as we went along now we just didn't have the resources the human resources and the monetary resources to do that this time around and I think it really shows in the legs I do think even in that bottom-up approach, if you have a look at who, what reflects our real society, who should be in the room, and how do we support them to be in the room to tell us what, what, what they want and what they need. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move around to other members now. Rosemary? Yeah, thank you. Um, Theresa, you spoke about rural policy and having a rural framework. 
Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on what you, ex what you would like to see in this rural framework? And I'll open it out to everybody to yeah, um, ask. That's a very good question. I mean, I suppose rural development is so broad, um, but certainly we would like to see um, actions or activities that support the rural economy, yep. um, that look at enterprise and entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, that support the health and well-being of our rural citizens, um, looking at community facilities and, and uh, health and well-being issues, um, also about employability and, and you know jobs locally for people um, to access, about farm diversification. So I mean it's a whole breadth of activities, um, but certainly it would cross uh, social, economic, and environmental um, strands, and that's what we would like to see in a, in a new future rural development framework. Yeah. I suppose just to add to that, Rosemary, I mean, the, the department have already started looking at the rural policy framework, which you were at the event that day, mm -hmm. um, and they've identified connectivity, urban rural connectivity, to rural tourism, entrepreneurship, um, um, employability, employability, and, and health and well-being. Health and well-being. Health and well -being. So those are, are the themes, the headline themes that they're looking at uh, as a department. Um, and I suppose, I mean, you can't really speak for them. They'll, they'll yeah. probably come along at some stage and, and present to the committee on, on the work that they have developed to date. But I think from the, the talk that day, certainly the stakeholders that were in the room, there was a, it, was a, it was a big event. A lot of a lot of people there, a lot of you know great engagement. And I think certainly at our table, people were you know conscious that you know, there was scope within those themes to do lots of different things. Um, and I suppose it's trying to narrow down on, you know, because the Rural Development Programme can't do everything for everyone in rural communities, it's trying to narrow down on what are the, the actions and interventions and projects that are going to make the most effect um, for, the, for the largest number of people. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, well, just in terms of that approach, it, it, is, it has been very proactive and it is very timely. Uh, our new Rural Development Framework needs to be in place on the department and you um, give credit to the department for putting that effort in at, at this stage. And it just relates back to your uh, uh, question, uh, Declan, in terms of, of um, the approach. It has involved stakeholders at every level, uh, right across all of the workshops, right across the conferences, etc. I expect that that will continue, so that, that has been very much welcomed in the rural community. Mm -hmm. And just on the following, and what about the so soft and hard infrastructure, you know, our broadband too, I presume you... Yeah, and that, I mean, and that infrastructure and our road, our buses, etc. Yeah, I mean, I mean uh, Aidan mentioned connectivity there. Um, I mean, that and that came up at the event that we yeah. had um, as well very strongly. That that underpins a lot of what goes on in rural, rural communities. Um, and I suppose from that regard, it's about ensuring that we can get all departments to work together because some of these things are not the responsibility of DARE and we accept yeah, yeah. that and they're not going to fit within a rural development programme but it's how we can work better and align the policies to I suppose create that vision that we're looking for so um, we do need to look at how we align up other policies of other departments in order to address those issues. Uh -huh. Thank you sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, move on around, uh, William. Thank you Mr Chairman and you're very welcome. Um, I was in the lag, sat in the lag some years ago when I was on council, so I mean, I did see the good work that, that they do and uh, well, how it delivered in that regard. I see the 70 million from 14 to 20. Does that run out at the end of this year or the start of this year? That 70, that the program that works at the end of this year, I presume, is it the end of 2020? Yes? Yeah, that'll be over the duration of the program from 2014 to 2020, and there'll be expenditure beyond that, but that's over that duration. Your, the 70 million that's allocated will be used, all right? It will be. It's, 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 it's on target, as far yeah, as we it's know. It's on yeah. target. I think we'll probably defer that question to the officials within within. I DL, understand it. In, ter in terms of exactly uh, what the spend, what the commitment, and what the job creation is. Um, but at, at, the, at this time. Sometimes it's very difficult to. to, to you know what drops out of the system and what doesn't. It's very difficult. Sometimes things can drop out of the system at the last minute. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There is, there is opportunity. There is <coughs> date at, at what level? I, I, am not, I'm not able to say. But there is commitment to date, and we expect that that full, full expenditure yeah. will take yeah. place by the end of, I think it's next year. I, uh, up to 2021 yeah. to get the yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yep. Thank you. Hey, William. Um, John. Yeah. Hey. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I start by putting on record, to, I'm sure you'd agree, the, our thanks for, to the Department and to, to those uh, here today for the event at Lockery. It was a very good and informative event. Uh, Rosemary's question, I think, went some of the way to, 
towards Brian Cohen, which is that given uh, and we've acknowledged, Tracy acknowledged, that some of the areas up for discussion are not strictly DERA responsibilities, well being health element, um, hard infrastructure, Department for Infrastructure, Economic Strategy, obviously Department for Economy. Um, what, how do you feel uh, in regards to the best way to deliver in that interdepartmental approach? Is it through the lags themselves? Does it need another structure? How, how can we ensure that all departments are um, applying themselves to the issues where it matters and when it matters, and how, and how do we deliver that? In your opinion, I mean, I know these are things that well, all of us have to discuss, but I'm very keen to know um, how you think is the best way to go to this. I think that in some to, to date, the, the, this department, this particular department, has shown uh, leadership and been able well, to department. yeah yeah and been able to pilot a lot of schemes that that have been taken on. I have, for example, um, we we talked in the past about um, small programs around transport, and those have been taken on by the, by the, the that particular department. Likewise, around mental health, and the, the, the issue has been much more has come much more to the fore in terms of rural mental health and, and, and those issues. So the department has dipped its toe on many occasions, particularly through the TRIPSI programme, yes. um, to look at um, various areas where they have piloted but have managed to create um, partnerships with other departments who have the sole responsibility to take on. Um, so I, I, in, my, in my view, the DARE has already started that. Um, and, and hopefully that will continue, and the other departments then will take on uh, the sole responsibility of delivering on those areas which are very clearly lie within their their uh, gambit. But from um, agriculture and rural development, the, the issue of um, participants and beneficiaries being from rural areas is, is is the issue because it highlights the fact that there is a saturated. Uh, issues in those particular areas. Okay. I, I would say as well that we're not none of us here are under any illusions that our departments have not always worked really well together. And the challenge for the assembly now really is where are their synergies? Where can they save money by complementing what each other does, by somebody giving a bit and somebody else giving a bit instead? You know, I mean, I, I think that's a challenge for the Assembly at the minute when uh, clearly it seems there's not enough money in the pot for everything. So how do, we, how do we go about it? And I suppose communities, and particularly rural communities, are excellent at doing that because we've had to do that because we've been so mm. under-resourced uh, and we all work together as probably why our four organisations are all sitting here. We have to find ways to work together, and I think the Assembly really have to do that. And whether that is internally here, when you're looking at a rural development programme, that there is somebody from each department at a meeting and saying, well, we're already doing a bit on that, and we were hoping to do... But, you know, that mm. has to happen. I mean, there's no question that that needs to happen. I, th I think it's really... <laughs> That's a really difficult question. It's a good question. It's a really difficult question for, for us to answer. I think some of it is down to leadership from the executive. Yeah. Um, and I know it's very early days yet in terms of this new executive, but in terms of ministers working together, um, in terms of delivering you know, across the needs for, for rural areas across, across different departments. Um, obviously, there is a Rural Needs Act. Um, which was brought in in 2016. That is just the second monitoring report um, was released there just in December um, that DERA compiled. In our view, that could work better. It could be working deeper. It's going to take time to embed that into departments. That's starting, I think, to trickle out. We're seeing a, a more comprehensive monitoring report this year than we did in the first year. Um, but these are big issues. It's a huge challenge, and for us, I think, you know, for our organisation certainly, and probably for the other organisations, it comes down to this idea of balanced regional development, which is an executive priority. Yep. Um, if we want to achieve that, then we're going to have to think about how we, you know, deliver public transport, think about delivering health services, education, you know, every, you know, everything is going to have to, th we're going to have to try and think about that because, and have really difficult conversations because, I suppose, rural citizens see that. And they see that when they read that we need health services reconfigured, they immediately are going to, well, that's our local hospital now under threat. 
Um, mm. And those are difficult conversations to have for any, certainly for politicians, for citizens, um, for people in rural constituencies. Mm. I suppose our question would be, or our way of thinking about it would be that, you know, if we are thinking about reconfiguring health, then we need to be talking about the, to the Department of Infrastructure about, well, if we're taking services away from <coughs> more peripheral parts of rural Northern Ireland, then how are we ensuring that we have the network there, the road infrastructure there, the ambulance infrastructure there to ensure citizens can still access the services? Mm. There may be a clear clinical argument for you know consolidating health services. You know, the stroke care consultation last summer was one which attracted a lot of public interest. And on the way, um, Bangoa and services are, are going, and it's been clearly flagged up in the new decade of approach um, document. Um, these are going to be difficult conversations, but I think they can only happen if Department of Health officials are talking to Department for Infrastructure officials, um, for instance, in that case. And I know maybe we've strayed a bit off the, the topic. Okay. Not apologies for that. Just, just, we're, we're not straying really. I think, I think we're really starting to tie things together. Um, you would agree, all of you, I'm sure, though, that if, if departments, whether DERA leads uh, generally or health leads okay. in health, but DERA. Whatever, whatever that configuration of collaboration and co-design and all of the things that are talked about in new decade, mm -hmm. new approach, by the way, which doesn't say the word rural once, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, you'd agree, I'm sure, the priorities should be that the departments should talk to yourselves mm -hmm. before the co-design is designed, as it were, that, that we should be talking to yourselves about what's best received and easiest to deliver on the ground. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. I suppose I mean some of that work's maybe started through the, the rural framework that we've talked yeah. about and you know there is the working groups and we've had the, the rural stakeholder events. So I mean there's a body of evidence starting to grow around what that should look like. So um, I think that's useful to, to, to note as well. The, the, that bottom up approach is most certainly probably the best way to ensure that you engender all of the ideas and all of the issues and then bring it into the department yeah. for, for for consideration. But if we're, we're, as Aidan has mentioned, rural needs. There's also community planning, which is, which is important in, in this, uh, and the effect of delivery of, com of local community plans in, in the, at a local level, and then you're up down, whereby you're linking in with with the executive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Claire. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you very much. It's good to see you here. Um, and good to hear you just mentioned community planning there as well, and that's what was in my head. Um, and hearing that our rural, rural communities have seen an 18% population growth in recent years is just mm -hmm. kind of it's shocked or stunned, but I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it certainly surprised me. I wouldn't have ever put it th that high. But with that in mind, then obviously local councils have a great part to be playing there too. Absolutely. I'm imagining then that there's a lot of development going on, a lot of house building, not, not a lot, but. You know, house building, attracting new people in, and then planning land with local councils. So, in terms of that local community infrastructure, in terms of your roads and your schools and healthcare facilities, and that, you know, it's certainly. I mean, I'm South Belfast, and I know sometimes these don't go hand in hand when they're planning. So, I imagine that's a lot of added stress going on within your local areas, but. We'll be coming back and I think what John was getting at with the questions and what was coming back there as well, that whole co-design element of it, and I 100% agree that you need ring fence <coughs> funding um, and it's really disappointing to see that we're not even having that within the, the bill discussions uh, moving on as well. But if, the money, if, if there was a ring fence budget put up, um, do you have a framework? or a discussion paper or a sort of agreed plan of action that you would like to see? I suppose that's maybe that's the work that's ongoing yeah. with the department at the minute um, and they have engaged stakeholders and, and there's a stakeholder event so there is a, a I suppose a developing framework that obviously okay. would need to be um, discussed further you know um, with mm -hmm. the department but um, there is a development framework. And, and, and as and far as we know there that I think the plan is mm. that that will go out to full public consultation, consultation yeah. later in the year. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the department will be bringing that. Mm. I'm sure here. Yeah. Uh, but it, they have said they're going to full public consultation. I think they're aiming yeah. for the late spring. Okay. And, and it's quite inclusive in terms of the areas that it looks at, right? From connectivity, yeah. inclusivity, social inclusion, which necessarily wasn't necessarily 
for example, part and parcel of the previous rural development or the current rural development programme, but it is looking at, at those areas which Tripsy and the social and the rural development programme would have worked on together. So it's it, it, it's it's more um, it's probably a more generic approach to all of the different uh, issues that are in rural areas. Okay, and again, my. My knowledge of Tripsy is really quite limited. I'm on catch up here, but in terms of that, so we can have a rural development plan, and yes, we'll have different executive bodies or departments you know, tasked with different things, so transport, for example, or health, or um, era here as well. Um, but were those funding or were those plans led? With others feeding into them, did they have a, a like a, a lead? So we can be a leader. This department can be a lead on coming up with the rural development plan, and then you can have infrastructure committed to budgetary um, plans in terms of transport and education with theirs and health with theirs as well. But is it one central plan? That seems to be the vision at the minute, does it? I mean, I suppose we have been, I suppose historically we've been working to the EU framework. So essentially, there was a, a menu of activities at an EU level, which then we um, would have bid in and delivered under leaders. So yeah. that would have been done, I suppose, in isolation of other departments. It's fair to say, you know, because it was a specific program yeah. uh, designed at, at a European level. Um, I suppose the opportunity um, is there now to look at how we do it differently and how we can integrate those other departments into it. Um, so, you know, I suppose that's the future vision that we have um, you know, to, to consider. But ultimately, previously, it would have been done at an EU level and, and then the, the schemes would have been delivered locally through a... I suppose the, the, the local action groups would have developed a plan locally, but it was against a prescribed list of measures, um, and then they delivered that locally. Um, so it wasn't integrating with other government yeah. departments, but there is an opportunity mm. to do that. And there's, a bit, there's already been, mm. through Thripsy, there's been a bit of a tradition has been yeah. started on that yeah. in terms of yeah. you know different schemes that the department have initiated, the likes of the Mara project, which was about benefit uptake and ensuring that people knew about the all the benefits they were entitled to, but also the community services. That was a partnership project between DERA and the Public Health Agency. Um, there was an assisted rural transport scheme, mm -hmm. which was around funding the community mm -hmm. transport partnerships to enable mm -hmm. uh, people who are eligible to use the smart buses and community transport to link them in with the public transport hub. I mean, that's a that was a fantastic, very innovative scheme. Like, you know, we've seen heard like academics from. UK, like going, this was a really, this was a really brilliant program. Yeah. It's something that's still being funded, and for us, it's something you know that you know that those types of schemes provide provide practical solutions um, for people. That really, you know that are really valuable, really valuable. Um, speaks to that issue of isolation that we were talking about right at the start. I think Aidan just mentioned one word: innovative. The, the, the Tripsy program is, is very innovative. It, it's not as prescriptive as the rural development program. Uh, but the, the opportunities there now to look at uh, across across those delivery mechanisms, and uh, to look at where and how the department working in, in, in collaboration and partnership with local communities, where there where there is a very strong infrastructure and local voluntary organisations can deliver at local level to meet whatever needs are are found in, in very particular areas. So where I live in the Cookstown, Mid Ulster, Dungannon area, it most certainly will be different from yeah. from 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 Anna and North Antrim, but there will be similarities in, from a generic strategic approach that the, the department can provide programmes and, and projects under this bill or under any other alternative bills to allow local needs to be met uh, as, as for example through those innovative Tripsy programmes. But Tripsy was only a very small budget, for, I, I think it was only 3 to 4 million vis-a-vis -vis 70 to 80 million of, of, of RDP monies. I think the okay. fact that even there was a justification for having that programme Evidence is the fact that the rural development program, as it was, didn't really, with all of that money, didn't really address those those issues. I think that uh, we were steering off the agriculture a good bit when we were talking about but I do understand. I'm very familiar with it, and it's it's a really good example of where a relatively little amount can go a long, long way. Yeah. Um, um, Morris, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thanks very much for your presentation. I uh, find it very interesting. Uh, you, you expressed concern uh, over the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. And some of the, the, the conversations that we have had earlier today, uh, the topic of a separate Northern Ireland Agricultural Bill arose. Do you see, if there were a separate Northern Ireland Agricultural Bill, do you see your role being either uh, met on that, as opposed to trying 
You raise your concerns through the UK agriculture bill. Well, potentially, yeah. We think, well, first of all, we've got access um, yeah. to, you know, to the committees like this, to MLAs, to councillors who will have access to people who are making decisions. We potentially would have access to department officials. Um, certainly within this last couple of years when it's not, I suppose you can't talk about UK Shared Prosperity Fund proposals because they haven't even come out yet. Um, but we felt certainly as, as you know, small voluntary organisations um, in Northern Ireland that we had no real could, could have no way of influence in that debate at UK wide level. Um, so I suppose something closer to, to Northern Ireland is, is by its nature we will have at least be engaged in the conversation and know some of the decision makers that are engaged in the debate. So I would say yeah, like my instinct would be yes. Mm -hmm. I suppose my only comment to add would be is, as long as that bill extended sufficiently to cover rural development as well as agriculture um, you know because the two you know should sit well beside each other but it's just that as long as it covered the aspects of rural development that we're talking about we'll give you a more accessible yeah. avenue to explore yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. thank you morris um and thank you for your representation i should say just before i just in the back of what was morris's question um we will we will we will be furnishing uh, the, the department, obviously, with our findings from the evidence you presented, indeed, all of the deliberations in the context of agriculture bill. But not only that, there we will also be feeding it in to the. We're actually meeting the House of Lords EU committee on Tuesday, and also, and I'll seek the permission of the committee for the agreement of the committee. This is that we would forward uh, certainly. The research paper and all of the hands out of all the proceedings relating to agriculture bill to the House of Commons Agriculture Bill Committee as well. So the committee will care that we'll feed all that in. So listen, you have us here, but we'll also feed it right, uh, you know, to the executive, to the minister, to the departments, and to the House of Lords and Commons as well. So I want to take the opportunity to thank you, uh, Connor, Aidan, Teresa, and Louise for coming up here today and. Don't be strangers, you're always welcome back. Thank you for okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, uh, uh, oral back to oral sessions again from the Northern Ireland Meat Exposures Association and Dairy UK. Um, the briefing paper from the Exposures Association and Dairy UK is at 51 to 52 of the table pa papers. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Paul Donnelly from the NA Meat Exposures Association and Dr Mike Johnson, from the, who's the NA Director of Dairy UK. Um, You'll have ten minutes to, to brief the committee, if that's okay, and after which uh, the members will have the opportunity to, um, to ask some questions of this. Okay, so if you want to, uh, um, thank you very much. I'm grateful for the committee for the invitation to uh, discuss the agriculture. Um, my name is Colin Donnelly from the Northern Ireland Meat Exporters Association. I'm the representative body for uh, red meat producers in Northern Ireland. Uh, our members have uh, uh, eight businesses across uh, uh, 10 to 12 sites across Northern Ireland. Uh, they are members of our organisation. Um, we are the primary processors of um, beef and lamb in Northern Ireland, um, supplied by 20,000 uh, uh, farmers um, in Northern Ireland. and. Uh, and supplying multiple retailers, food service businesses, um, and obviously business across the UK, Europe, and um, third country export. Um, so we um, uh, we have a, a, a very strong interest, obviously, in the agriculture bill um, because of the importance of 
our farmers to our supply chain and um, the sustainability of uh, farming in Northern Ireland um, and in beef and the uh, lamb sector that's absolutely vital. And um, we also have uh, broader interests uh, with respect to trade, um, uh, level playing fields, um, migration um, and, um, and uh, all, all tangential, but very much uh, mixed up in the kind of interface with uh, with uh, agricultural policy, and and how that's implemented. Um, so I think that's that's all I have to say. Okay. Uh, well, equally, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to uh, come along and uh, and meet with you this afternoon. Um, the Dairy UK membership in Northern Ireland. Um, is made up of three main dairy companies. Between them, they would collect and process about 90% of the milk that's produced in Northern Ireland, so a fairly substantial uh, segment of the, the dairy sector here. Um, they, they represent a broad spectrum of companies in terms of market focus. Uh, that varies between Northern Ireland, Great Britain, Ireland, uh, European Union, and indeed the rest of the world. And in that regard, um, if you, you look at the total UK export of dairy products outside the European Union to third countries, about 60% of those come from Northern Ireland. So we're a very, very significant exporter of, uh, of dairy products, and we rely heavily on export markets around the world. Uh, our companies would export to over 80 countries uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, obviously we're taking a keen interest at the moment at what happens uh, in China. Uh, but we do operate on an all-island basis. Uh, over the years we have developed uh, an all-island value chain um, and that has been based on the ability to move milk freely, to move products freely uh, on the island. Uh, we work uh, and compare with, with the, uh, our, our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland to common EU standards. Uh, we have the free movement of product and that has meant that the, the companies over two, three decades have developed an all-island value chain. Uh, and at the moment we would have probably about a third of our milk, raw milk, that's collected off farms in Northern Ireland, around about 800 million litres per year that goes down south for processing and then onward sail into uh, export markets. So there's a, a very good working relationship. The all-island dimension is very important to us. main market that we would have for our products is in Great Britain, um, but the rest of the world is extremely important. So um, in terms of what's happening um, within the EU uh, dimension, uh, the withdrawal agreement, the free trade negotiations, the protocol, all of that uh, impacts very, very heavily on our sector. Okay, um, thank very much for that. Um, we, um, I suppose just to ask you, I see in relation to the bill, it talks about the uh, traceability. How vital is it for? Your industry, um, that we have a foolproof, very strong and robust mechanism of traceability. Um, traceability is extremely important. Um, it's important for the integrity and the credibility uh, of the entire agri food sector. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a system that has been <coughs> built up over probably somewhere between 25 and 30 years. Um, and it means it's one of the oldest traces, traceability systems in the world that we have here. And certainly, um, when we talk to buyers and export markets, um, it's all about convincing them of the confidence and the trust that they can have when they source their dairy products from Northern Ireland. And there's a number of aspects to that particular jigsaw of the proposition to buy. And that revolves around things like the standards that we have, uh, but it's also around the, the checks and the balances, the auditing, the monitoring that the Department of Agriculture does on behalf of the Food Standards Agency. Key in that is the traceability system. And when we bring the buyers in here and we walk them the, the, the supply chain, 
We have people from the department who talk to them about the traceability system uh, and what that means. You can see the lights going on and it's about that confidence and the trust that they can have. So it's terribly important that we have uh, a standalone, robust traceability system in Northern Ireland that can reflect the needs and start to give us a competitive advantage here. Um, because there's been a lot of work that has gone into this over the years. And we, we have our supply chain is used now to working with this traceability system um, and recording. So, I mean, if, if you take, if I was to take you to uh, down to Newton Arts this, this afternoon to the Lakeland plant and you lifted a carton of UHT cream that was going to China, we can trace that back and tell you which farms and which cows were on that farm on the day that that was produced. So that's the level of uh, detail that we have in our system and uh, we need to hold on to that because when it comes to talking to briars and export markets, it's extremely important for us. So um, I hope that gives you a little bit of an insight mm. into what's involved and the importance and the significance to our sector. Maybe add, uh, from the point of view of the beef sector, I agree with everything that Mike said. A lot of those uh, points that Mike has made would have parallels in the beef sector, all of them. Um, where, where it's critically important is with respect to market access uh, also. Um, so in the beef sector, um, we wouldn't have the same scope of market access as the dairy industry has, so we have to go out into the uh, countries like China, Japan, uh, USA, and uh, demonstrate uh, that we have effective traceability systems in place in order to get the market access that we seek uh, in order to export beef into those markets. Historically, um, over the last 20 years, we have lost access because of uh, background BSE, and, um, and we're uh, on a long journey and well into that journey in terms of uh, regaining that market access. Traceability is a, a huge part of that, and it's also a huge part of uh, uh, you know, our obligations to uh, the EU and, um, and the implementation of the protocol that will require that we continue to align with EU rules on IRM. Now, that again is, is, uh, is, is, is going to be an important feature of the discussion around, uh, around the implementation of the protocol. One aspect of it is, is alignment with uh, EU regulation in respect of, of traceability. Where, um, where we're obviously um, keeping very close watch, and we'll, we'll need to keep a close watch on, is if there's divergence. Because uh, your traceability system, and we have APHIS in Northern Ireland, like says, is, is, uh, is a very long and well established system. Um, it has the confidence of uh, um, the industry, it's the it gives confidence also to our customers. Um, but it also has to interface. Uh, uh, through uh, traces to another system, the international system, with um, third countries, and GB is going to be a third country, for example, um, relative to um, Northern Ireland, um, with respect to that uh, that relationship uh, between the EU and, uh, and and the UK, and and that that's going to be a, a potential issue going forward um, in terms of maintaining and. Maintaining that alignment between ourselves in Europe and also uh, our own internal market in the UK. That's going to be a massive challenge going forward. Um, it goes beyond, obviously, it goes way beyond traceability. Traceability is one element of it. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I think it's just, it's, just, it's just one issue of many um, that we're going to have to watch out for in the divergence mm -hmm. space. Um, just before I move around here, uh, do you have any, um, the issue of migrant labour has become very topical, uh, particularly in light of the um, announcement yesterday by the British Home Office about their, their plans to reduce a point space system, which just focuses on skills. Do you have any assessment of the importance or importance of migrant labour to the meat and the dairy industry? Maybe go first on that because it's of crucial importance to us. Um, we, um, we surveyed our members um, uh, at the outset of the, um, just shortly after the referendum, and uh, 
sixty percent of uh, the people working on our as operatives in our industry um, and, and, and over um, is a range across plants, but an average of sixty percent, um, sixty to seventy percent were um, uh, EEA workers. So. First of all, we have a we have a significant exposure. Um, seasonal peaks that number could rise, um, and the the roles that uh, essentially uh, we are dealing with are on the on the factory floor. But there's you know a, a range from uh, unskilled to semi-skilled to skilled jobs, um, and essentially. I mean, if you if you go back in time, go back to 2002, before the accession states uh, came into the EU, uh, there was an issue with the availability of labour at that time, and uh, it was the availability of labour that allowed our industry uh, to grow um, over the course of the last 15 years. It was a huge constraint um, back around the turn of the um, millennium, and. Um, there's a lot of codependence on labour within other sectors as well. Haulage, for example, um, migrant labour will be a feature there in the logistics sector. So it's not just on the retail sector too. So it's not just an issue within our part of the supply chain. There's codependences within other parts of the, the supply chain. Um, there has been this question of skilled versus unskilled labour, um, and I think it's important to recognise that you know, the primary need of uh, of agri-food processors and other sectors in the economy as well. We need labour. We need the availability of people to do the jobs. In our sector, what happens is we generally bring in people that are have been unskilled, but we train them, and and that's how we develop our skilled workforce. We train them into uh, skilled roles, and this is something that has been <coughs> largely uh, ignored uh, in the. In, 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 the, in the policy statement um, that we seen yesterday, um, we train them and they become our skilled workers. That's our source of skilled workers, and they learn English when they're here, and they contribute to the overall economy. and And we are very appreciative of the contribution they make to our businesses, but I think they make a contribution to society as well that needs to be recognised. Um, if we look at, you know, one member has informed me that. If they applied the pine space system uh, to their um, business, uh, 80 per cent of the staff that they brought in the last 10 years wouldn't have, uh, would have got 20 points, and, and uh, 15 would have got, 15 per cent would have got 40 points, and 5 per cent would have got 30 points on the basis of that um, entry system. So it's a huge challenge here for us. Um, this is a challenge that we have made very, very clear to the Home Office over the course of the last year. They launched a, the Home Office launched a, a kind of year-long consultation to the Immigration White Paper in um, at the end of uh, 2018, and ultimately there was a there was various groups set up and there was various forms of consultation. But at the end of that consultation period, we've seen a policy that bears no relation to the White Paper that was introduced and that we were, uh, and that we were consulted on. Um, we. Um, we are looking across the border, and one of the points that we made was very, very strongly uh, in that consultation period was that we are competing in the North Island economy, and we are competing in the current UK economy. But effectively, our businesses have to be able to compete uh, with competitors in the Republic. And not only do they have continued access to the free movement in the single market, uh, they have additional access to low-skilled workers. Um, from third countries for meat, horticulture, and dairy processing, and and that's in salaries uh, at twenty-two thousand euro. So this is this is this is available to Irish processors over and above membership of the single market for labour. We won't have that, and we won't have access to the single market for labour either. And we're already facing huge pressures in terms of turnover of staff due to exchange rate um, pressures. And over the last three years, because of this notion of a cold house. Uh, as well, and that's the competitive environment that we are in, and that was something that was made very, very clear. And actually, the MAC acknowledged this, and the MAC would have, you know, we would have considered the MAC to be quite hard line, but the MAC acknowledged that we do have a, a, a specific interest uh, in Northern Ireland regionally, 
They said the situation of Northern Ireland is unique as the only part of the UK with a land border with the EU and a labour market more distinct from the rest of the UK. Special consideration could be given to Northern Ireland, especially if it comes to have a different relationship with the EU compared to the rest of the UK. And, and effectively, that is the case with the protocol. Um, and, uh, and we haven't seen that reflected, obviously, in the policy. Uh, so the question is, what do we need? And uh, I mean, you know, we have the situation where there's free movement of goods potentially in the island. Um, certainly, there is free movement of goods in the island, but uh, you know, there could be a free trade agreement with Great Britain uh, or with the EU, uh, EU and UK. But we have free movement of goods uh, across the island, but we don't have free movement of labour, and, that, that, and that's a massive issue because what that will encourage is, uh, if the, the goods can come into Northern Ireland tariff free and free movement there, but there's not free movement of, 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 of migrant labour in particular, low skilled workers, then operations in Northern Ireland become less competitive and what you'll see is capital moving to where the labour is. And that, that, that's a, effectively uh, the situation we've been placed in and that, and that is something we have made very, very clear over the course of the last year uh, and more actually over the last 18 months. And uh, you know, we could you know we could seek changes to the um, Points based system. We could seek, you know, butchers to be put on the shortage occupation list. Additional points for job offers from a Northern Ireland business. There are things that maybe could be done in the context of the point based system, but it, it certainly needs to be addressed because otherwise, um, this, you know, we are sitting at the moment where we have to align to EU rules. Um, we have the obligations of EU membership, but we don't have any of the benefits. And that, that, that is essentially where decisions like this leave us. And I don't think I don't think that there has has been has been reflected in, in the policies that we're seeing coming out um, on labour. Okay, well, from a dairy sector perspective, we're not as anywhere close to being as exposed as that. We reckon maybe in around about somewhere in twelve to fifteen percent of the labour uh, is non Northern Ireland, uh, so we're not as exposed from that point of view. Uh, the only other thing I would say, in, in addition to what Colonel has said, is that our concern would be in the medium term. Uh, that is, as this sort of policy would start to, to click in, um, that you would start to see significant uh, cost inflation for companies, and that could start to hit at our competitiveness, especially if we're having to trade into Europe on an increasing basis. Um, and as Colonel has said, are not working with the same sort of constraints that we would be having to work with. So um, it, it's more in that medium term that we would have the concerns around this. Yeah, I'll go past around some members here. William, you're first on the list. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and you're both very welcome. Uh, I suppose reality is that the, the trade talks and the trade negotiations and the outcome of them is going to be vital to way forward for both the dairy sector and the beef sector. Uh, it appears for many of us that, the, that food would be let into, into the UK that is a lower standard. And therefore, I think, which is both said earlier, it's vital that our, we maintain our standards and, and a high level and we have a red tractor. And, uh, most, I think most of the dairy industry now have a red tractor. I'm not sure if they no. similar. Yeah, so... Um, can you see any immediate? De and we, know, we know, for instance, there's been pressure on prices, and beef prices has been poor enough. Many beef producers are not that happy, as you know, and probably losing money this winter. So, um, you would say difficult times ahead, would you? Um, I, I think that the um, there's a no, the, the, there's a number of aspects. In I think the the current trade policy that's out for for consultation is going to be terribly important and uh, I think you've, you've hit it in the head that we need to make sure that the UK market um, maintains its integrity, uh, that it does not lower the standards to bring in um, cheap, uh, cheaper food. Um, I think that would be disastrous for the whole of the, the UK agri-food sector, not just Northern Ireland. Um, but I think that uh, it brings us into a number of other areas, such as this notion of unfettered access, uh, what free trade agreements that the, the UK will do in the future. 
um, because um, you know, depending on what free trade might uh, free trade agreements might be put in place with other countries, that could very well then start to impact uh, how the tr movement of product across the REC in both directions uh, will be affected. So there's an awful lot in there in terms <laughs> of the future free trade agreements that the UK will do. And I think that it's uh, terribly important that we make sure that Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland Agri-Food in particular has a very, very strong voice in that, because otherwise we could find ourselves in the, wor the, the worst of both worlds, um, that we would have uh, difficulty in accessing uh, on a competitive basis the GB market, um, and we may not have the same sort of uh, access into the uh, EU in terms of the product uh, portfolios, the supply chains that we would currently have. So there's there's so many issues in there. So it's a little bit like a an onion. Ever you know when you start and you peel it back, the various layers. There's more that's in below there. Uh, but in essence, uh, we would be very very concerned uh, to make sure that the UK government does not lower the bar and simply allow uh, other products uh, products from other countries in uh, for reasons of expediency. Yeah, I think I think the the one word. That we should be looking for in our, you know, we're looking at an agricultural bill here, um, and it makes very few references to trade, um, and the, there is a, a tariff uh, policy consultation ongoing now, is finishing at the March. But the one word I would be looking for when looking at both those policies is coherence. We can't, on one hand, as a, a UK can't, on one hand, as a um, UK government can't, on one hand ask um, its producers to attain the highest levels of welfare, the highest levels of environmental standards, um, you know, pay uh, you know, very generous um, um, living wages and minimum wages and all those things I think our, our industry support. Um, but you cannot ask that on one hand and then open the market up to competition from third country markets that don't apply those standards. And, um, and we have to see coherence between those two policies, um, and and I think that's I mean I think that's key, and it, it, it applies both respect to um, you know tariffs and also standards. Um, you know, if we're you know in terms of the standards that have been applied to uh, production, um, um, so you know effectively <clears throat> what we're looking for is is a level playing field. I mean, I think this, uh, the level playing field concept is something that you know it's a bit um, nebulous in some ways, but you know it's hard to tie down. Um, but I mean, I think it's you know at a, at a kind of a very basic level, it's very unfair to expect uh, UK producers and Northern Ireland producers. I mean, the, the UK market is our biggest market. It, it, you know, 75 percent of what we produce goes into the UK market. So it's therefore it's something that you know. We need to maintain our unfettered access to that market, absolutely. But we also want to maintain the value of that market. Um, and you know, the risk is that you end up with a, 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 a an almost a, a race to the bottom. Um, and uh, you know, with, with with producers expected to apply, you know, you know, all of the standards that we would expect, but importers not. Um, and that, that's something I, I think that you know we would be looking to. Um, our politicians in Northern Ireland to, to defend strongly against. I think that the other point is that if we were in that situation where uh, government were lowering the standards, the reality is that the, the, the industry in Great Britain would have a better chance of being able to adapt to that, whereas we in Northern Ireland have to adhere to the EU standards. So we cannot compromise. Whereas the sector, the industry in, in Great Britain, at least would have a chance to adapt to those lower standards and uh, whatever the price competition that would come with that might be, we couldn't. So effectively, if you if you follow that through, it would mean that the the GB market probably uh, would start to be closed off to us because we simply couldn't compete. Claire. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you very much. I think you're putting a very 
stark reality about how you, how messy this whole process is. Um, and, and you rightly raise um, that the bill um, doesn't raise issues around matters that are reserved, those that are devolved, and those that come under the protocol. And that a tri level of trying to get a balance here. Um, but maybe we'll stick with that. Um, the point that you're making on part four in terms of marketing standards and the possible divergence between the UK and the EU, um, and that the, there's no rec recognition in the bill about any future potential divergence as well. But what, in that context, what would you like to see DERA do to try and address that? Well, I think that um, it, divergence is really um, it, it's the nightmare scenario yeah. for us. Um, so I think that the, the sort of thing that we would be looking for is, in the first instance, recognition that Northern Ireland companies will be disadvantaged uh, if that is the case, and that there is provision there to have a basket of safety net measures that will allow our companies to be able to continue to operate in the GB market um, and will not be penalised. It comes back to what uh, Conal was saying about a level playing field. That's absolutely essential for us. For if we don't have a, a level playing field, and that could not just in relation to Great Britain, it can be looking south of the border as well, um, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, so that's absolutely essential. And I think that um, as well as trying to make sure that in terms of the negotiations that will happen within the joint committee structure on the protocol, I think it's essential that the, the recognition needs to go further and say, OK, if we are in that situation, we will have the, the ability to provide a basket of safety net measures. What those might be, I don't know. But we need that sort of commitment that there will be the opportunity for the, the executive here to step in and say, we realise you guys are in trouble. It's not of your making. Now, here's what we can do to help. And let me add to that. I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things I, 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 you know, I suppose um, we could mention. One is um, we're undoubtedly, I mean, funding isn't so much discussed in this policy as well. We're undoubtedly. We're, we're aligning with the EU, um, EU standards and the EU approach. Um, that may not continue in Great Britain, um, but the budget for our agriculture and policy is going to be critical. You know, I mean, you know, our, because of our, the approach we've taken here, and we should be seeking to align our funding with the support levels that are provided, for example, in the Republic, um, to ensure that. So under the pillar one, pillar two, we get the kind of support to our farmers that they need to compete in that environment. Because we're all, ultimately what you're looking at here is a kind of a highest common denominator type approach. Um, and the second thing I think we need to avoid at all costs is if there is divergence, any any form of kind of commercial or accidental discrimination against uh, against what we produce. Um, Ensure that we we don't find ourselves because of, as you said, different marketing standards or um, things like that, that somehow um, you know products from Northern Ireland uh, don't meet a specification required in Great Britain. Not because um, um, we don't want to, but because we can't, um, because we have to align with the rules. So I think that that's a that's a question for our place in the UK internal market. There's been very, very little discussion about the functioning of the UK internal market. You know, we've had lots of discussion around the functioning of the EU internal market and protection of the integrity of the UK, EU internal market. One of the things that I, 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 I mean, I don't, I don't think a lot of people have cottoned on to this, is that the single market, um, you know, when it arrived in, in the early 90s, um, was there whenever devolution happened. And then devolution happened. And it provided the stitch and it kept the UK internal market together. But that stitching has now been taken away. And th this is why there's these issues between devolved, reserved, and protocol type matters. Um, and there has to be a great deal of thought. And again, this feeds into this question of agricultural policy and, um, and, and, and trade also. That if there 
if you're going to have a functioning, a properly functioning internal UK market, um, then we can't have a lot of divergence between, uh, you know, that any kind of divergence has to be very, very carefully managed. And I think what would be important to see is some kind of uh, ongoing protection to ensure that where divergence was being proposed, that there was a very clear duty on uh, the UK government to ensure that that, uh, that divergence didn't damage the interests of Northern Ireland businesses, because ultimately we have no choice but to remain aligned with uh, the, the standards that are currently going to play or be applied in future on uh, the EU side. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Claire. John. Thank you, Chair. I think my question has been answered. It was really in the context of is marketing going to be more difficult when, when all of these processes are in place? I think the answer is certainly that it has the potential to be more difficult in relation to what you said there to, to Claire. Um, and the next part of the question would be what, what can we do about it? And I think you've answered where the potential for difficulties lie and also what we are required to do in putting up a robust defence if the emergence is working against us or if we find ourselves disadvantaged with no fault of our own, then that's basically good. And you want the answer to that, please. Right? Well, but there is a question of you know, you know, our competitiveness. You know, if there's technologies that we can't use in Northern Ireland that can be used in Great Britain, um, you know, one example would be GMO, uh, but there, there are probably others, you know, and and the pace of change. Um, so if, if if that leaves if that leaves farmers in Northern Ireland, uh, you know, less able to compete, and thus then the kind of processors um, also then. We become it makes it more, more difficult for us uh, to compete in the in the GB market. So there's a we're, we're in this situation where you, you know we have the potential. You know there's the potential there in this term. The best of both worlds been bandied about, and you know, you know what we don't want to be is where we're neither fish nor fowl or caught between two stools. I mean, which is um, is probably where the risk is, um, and it, it takes a responsible approach. I mean, I, I think that's. That's what we need on both sides. I think there was. What, what, what does responsible mean? On the UK side, it means probably minimising divergence, and on the EU side, it means maximising flexibility where possible, and to ensure that we are not caught in the middle. And you know, is 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 that what we're seeing at the minute? Um, we're probably not. Uh, we're probably not seeing much of that. I think you know, the word divergence rolls off the tongue terribly easily, but from what we've been saying, hopefully, you can start to see the complexity. Um, and the importance and the significance. Um, so I think there's a job of work to be done to really start and ease this divergence out and, and delve into it. And for example, um, if you accept that there will be divergence, then what sort of appeal process would there be for a company in Northern Ireland that feels that it's being disadvantaged for whatever reason? Um, and will the cost of engaging in a pro, uh, an appeal process be prohibitive for a smaller company? So there's lots of issues in there that need to be looked at. Um, it's a wide, wide area. And we have only scratched the surface of it here this afternoon. Um, Morris? Thank you, Chair. Chair, I'll be brief. I just wanted to uh, say thank you very much for your your comprehensive presentation, but most importantly, your comprehensive answers. And just one point, and that was, you, you alluded to the integrity to protect the internal UK market, but not only that, the standards of the UK food, especially for Northern Ireland. Could you maybe expand a wee bit on that for me? Well, maybe you have the, uh, the, the, the example with maybe some of the, the meat that would be coming in and the standards that would be... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you know, talking about integrity. I, I mean, um, you know, there is this, you know, concept in the EU of the four freedoms, and that, you know, we talk about the integrity of the, uh, the single market of the EU. But same, those types of principles should be applied in the UK. You know, um, you know, um, and, but if, if we if we have a situation where our our farmers, um, our farmer suppliers are required to adhere. To you know what are and what we would expect to be and what the UK consumer expects to be robust standards, um, um, but 
um, we have a situation, you know, particularly around you know environmental, for example. I mean, we believe that we produce uh, the most environmentally sound beef in the world in many respects, particularly with respect to GHGs, because of the you know use of grass and then the contribution of se you know, towards se of sequestration and towards uh, the environment. Um, you, know, you compare that with uh, beef produced in other parts of the world where there's less water, there's more for, uh, you know, destruction of forestry and rainforests and whatnot. And, and what you're looking for is coherence. Um, I suppose uh, what we're looking for is coherence. Uh, that we're not expected to uh, um, apply standards here in, in, in Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK that are not uh, being expected of importers. I think that's. There's an integrity in that um, that I think that's important. So I think if you look at the standards, you know, we would be looking, you know, in any free trade agreement, that government, would, the UK government, would be looking at things like the quality standards, uh, the animal welfare standards, the environmental standards, the overall consumer safety standards that we have to work to, and those have compliance with those has a cost. So if you have got companies that are importing or uh, selling into the UK that don't have those sorts of standards that they operate to, well, de facto they'll have lower costs and be able to undercut. Now, from a consumer point of view, does the consumer want any compromising in these standards? I don't think so. So it's that onus on the government not to compromise for whatever reason or to trade off agri-food against whatever other sector, uh, for, for expediency purposes. That's the important thing. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, just, just one other point in that act there around, around integrity. Um, there's also a risk. Um, there's also a risk of bridges. Um, we want our supply chains to continue to work today, or tomorrow, they're going to do today. So, um, you know, some of our members, and most of our members in Northern Ireland are about producing Northern Ireland beef. Northern Ireland farms, but there's some some factories in Northern Ireland are engaged in, uh, you know, importing carcass beef from the Republic of Ireland, uh, processing it in Northern Ireland, selling it into GB and selling it into the EU. Um, some um, some some beef comes from uh, um, uh, GB to NI as well, carcass beef um, and and boneless beef for processing. Um, you know, that's all contingent on having a flexible. Process at uh, at our um, ports to ensure that we can trade seamlessly with Great Britain back and forth. That's going to be very challenging going forward. And in terms of integrity, what we don't want to see is um, while we want to maintain uh, the trade flows of existing businesses and ensure that they can continue to operate as they do today, we don't want to see our um, Northern Ireland turn into a back door into the UK market either. Because as I say we want to maintain the value of the UK market. Um, but there is this risk of, um, of, 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 of backdooring, and again, that's a question of integrity um, uh, for the market. Um, so we don't want to see that um, uh, 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 being undermined. Thank you, um, Just to, on the back of your comments there, um, Connell, um, you know you that the Department of uh, International Trade they've lost public consultation around international global tariffs. Um, I just wondering, could you expand, expand your thinking a little bit on that, and also on the non-tariff uh, barriers? And I know, for example, that some of the things you've mentioned be like exit declarations and things like that. There. So, what's your thinking around all that? Yeah, there's. I mean, you know, there's significant expense um, around non-tariff barriers. I mean, we have significant non-tariff barriers as it is. I mean, um, um, maybe digress slightly, if you'll uh, forgive me. I mean, for example. You know, uh, trading into third countries, um, we simply don't have market access at all into some third countries. That's, you know, that's a non-tariff barrier. We just simply can't export to a certain country, and we're trying to remove a lot of those non-tariff barriers at the moment. Um, for example, um, uh, China. Um, we've, um, you know, you know, uh, uh, since last year we've had factories approved, or one factory in Northern Ireland approved for China. Uh, you know, because of because of ongoing. Um, challenges. There hasn't been a, an ounce of beef exported uh, to China. So I mean, there's 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 challenges there in a global setting. Um, 
Um, yet, you know, across the border, they've had access to a lot of those markets uh, over the cl uh, course of the last uh, three and four years. You know, in, you know, China, America, all have seen, despite this kind of, um, um, you know, ambition of uh, of uh, of of global Britain. Um, you know, that hasn't really been reflected in the speed with which we've accessed third country markets because um, you know, we've seen other countries like, like the South get access to these countries before us and we're still struggling, uh, to be frank. But in terms of uh, in terms of those kind of non tariff barrier costs, um, you know, there's been various studies. I'm happy to um, forward information on. Um, there's a range in terms of, you know, um, you know, depending on how they're calculated, I've seen uh, non-tariff buyers calculated as much as 15%, and uh, maybe as little as 6 or 7%. But you know, I think the point is that we are operating in an industry with the margins um, one to two percent. So how do we how do we manage those kinds of uh, additional costs um, in terms of our kind of and of our trade, um, you know, domestic trade? Which is effectively there will be non potentially non tariff buyers trading from here to GB, albeit um, we're assured that there'll be very light touch, um, and also trade coming from GB to Northern Ireland. Um, so, you know, you have you have those barriers. Um, you know, the tariffs themselves. Um, I mean, we're fortunate. I think um, in some respects that the <coughs> protocol does give us access to the EU market, um, um, direct access to the EU market. Um, without tariffs, that's a benefit that we will have over competitors in Great Britain. Um, but um, in terms of access to uh, third countries, um, that's by no means um, settled. And one thing I talked earlier about having the obligations of uh, alignment, but not the benefits. We don't have access under this arrangement, direct access under this arrangement, to EU third country trade deals. Which is something that is regrettable, because I mean there are I think 52 agreements, um, and we're we're actively uh, trading through a, a, a good number of them, and um, um, one 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 that's very um, valuable to us, for example, is Canada. And uh, if we go back to um, last year, Canada. Um, um, Canada and the UK stopped their you know, negotiations whenever the UK published its tariff schedule um, for no deal because it wasn't worthwhile the Canadians negotiating any further because the UK had effectively given them all they'd asked for. Um, so at that point we we we, we had no access, um, you know, we, 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 we were on the risk of you know that Canadian trade deal up and rolled over and we don't have access through the UK market and we don't have direct access to it through the EU market. Um, so again, we don't want to be caught in that position. Be much more stiff. The burden of hands worth two in the bush. If we could have direct access to those EU trade agreements directly, um, it would be very valuable to us. If we don't have access to them, then we're into a, a, a challenge in terms of what the, um, the tariffs we'll face uh, going out to third countries if, the, if those deals aren't rolled over by the UK. And sorry, that's maybe a bit complicated, but uh, it's a challenge. Well. Um Mike and uh, Connell, I want to thank you uh, very much. That was very detailed, very comprehensive, and a very stark um, presentation we got from you today. I understand that you are making the House of Lords uh, Brexit Committee, or EU Committee, on Tuesday, so we're doing likewise. So your um, presentation here today was very timely, and we're very, very thankful for informing us of, uh, of the details you brought here today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to move on now to the Nora Evans from uh, the NA Environment Link, and pages 243 to 249 on your packet. If you want to come forward here to give up. I'd like to uh, welcome um, Sean Kelly, the Web Manager of NAEL, uh, Philip Carson, Policy Officer, RSPB, uh, um, Jennifer Fulton, CEO of Ulster Wildlife, and John Martin, Head of Policy and Advocacy of the RSPB, NA. And I want to advise representatives that there's, if you could do a 10 minute um, 
presentation to the committee, and then there will be an opportunity for the committees to ask some questions and maybe expand on some of the comments that you raised. So, you know, go ahead. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair, for uh, the welcome this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee for the invitation to provide evidence to the inquiry. Just by way of background and brief introduction, the Northern Ireland Environment Link is a network and forum body for non-statutory organisations concerned with the environment. Um, our 65 members represent over 120,000 individuals and manage a large land area, delivering a variety of uh, benefits for society. Um, just to move on to specifically some comments about the uh, agricultural bill, we'd just like to make a few, a few headlines, if you want, uh, for analysis of it. Um, firstly, to say we believe that it's in the best interest of Northern Ireland's economy and environment to keep farmers farming and therefore the maintenance of viable farm incomes is central to the delivery of any future agricultural strategy. However, we believe that new agricultural legislation must facilitate a transition towards sustainable agricultural policies and address environmental issues such as climate change, biodiversity loss, water and air quality, whilst of course also producing the food that we need. Reforming future payments to focus on public money for public good is one of the most important steps that the UK governments can take to fight the climate and nature emergency, and we would be advocating for a similar approach to be taken here in Northern Ireland. These public goods are the goods and services that society needs farmers to produce, but they are not paid for through the market, such as clean air, clean water, carbon storage, etc., all of which will help to contribute to our international obligations that are beyond the EU uh, obligations. Whilst acknowledging that Part 2, Clause 17 of the UK Bill requires UK-wide assessments of food security, this must include the sustainability of food consumed in the UK, whether produced locally or from overseas, and I'm aware of the fact that some of your previous speakers have, have highlighted the same issue. We believe that Northern Ireland and UK farmers should not be undercut by imported food produced to lower standards. Similarly, it's important that Northern Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales work together on an ambitious common framework for agriculture and the environment that prevents a deregulatory race to the bottom within the UK. Part 7, Clause 45, in conjunction with Schedules 5 and 6, outline the extent and the nature of the application of the Bill to Wales and to Northern Ireland. But there is, of course, an important difference. Section 44 outlines that the main provisions applying to Wales will expire in 2024, often referred to as a sunset clause, and this basically creates the onus on the Welsh Government to develop its own domestic legislation in a time-bound manner. With no sunset clause or similar in relation to Northern Ireland, provisions are not currently time-bound, presenting the risk that a business-as-usual approach may continue indefinitely. <laughs> This would see the continuation of the current system, widely regarded as inefficient, ineffective and inequitable, and lead to an incentivisation of a model of farming that has resulted in long-term declines in a range of environmental indicators, as evidenced by the State of Nature report for 2019. Some powers included within the Northern Ireland Schedule raise the potential to re-adopt farm support measures which represent an aggressive step, in our opinion, in the development of a fit-for-purpose agricultural policy. Alternative measures which seek to deliver environmental outcomes whilst benefit and farm profitability should be prioritised instead. For example, we note that the schedule allows for future support payments for areas of natural constraint. However, currently this support comes with little conditionality on exactly how the land needs or should be managed. It is the, their view, therefore, that the alternative policy tools could achieve greater impact for farming and the environment in these areas and so improve resilience and farm profitability in these challenging conditions in which they operate. Similarly, the schedule allows for the re-establishment of a voluntary coupled support scheme. Uh, it's interesting to note that Northern Ireland chose not to develop this scheme following consultation back in, with stakeholders back in 2016, and DRS stated at the time that if production is to expand in Northern Ireland, it should be built on a platform of profitability, not subsidy. Whilst the schedule therefore provides much needed certainty in the short term, Northern Ireland, through subordinate legislation, needs a bespoke long-term sustainable agriculture and land management policy in the form of its own Northern Ireland Agricultural Act. As stated in my earlier comments, any future agricultural 
Act for Northern Ireland should be sh shaped around the concept of public money for public goods and effectively integrate agricultural and environmental issues. Ambitious should be supported by long-term support which enables farm businesses to thrive in a new landscape underpinned by sustainability. As a priority, the Minister should set out a timeline for the development of such an Act, outlining how agricultural policy will deliver for nature, farming and the climate, so that the farming sector has the certainty and stability it needs. To conclude, Chair, we would recommend that the Committee endorse Schedule 6 of the UK Agricultural Bill for Northern Ireland, having given due consideration to the points that we have provided in their briefing, which I know you have already received. So, at that point, I will conclude and uh, say I would be happy to answer any questions on the evidence we have presented. Thank you. Thank you very much, that, and thank you very much for the very comprehensive <coughs> papers that you tabled to us as well. Um, uh, Philip, you are down to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for uh, coming along, and, and thanks very much for your introduction. In terms of the public service for public goods, mm -hmm. I mean, I just not, not a layman, but you know, a bit more detail because you hear that all the time and you see it read all the time. But sometimes you find it hard to actually visualise what it means. So, from your point of view, mm -hmm. what does that actually mean? I mean, that's one point. Mm -hmm. Secondly. You talked there about uh, the ANC areas and support payments for that. Just a wee bit of detail of the suggestions that you think could be made uh, to allow that to happen. Uh, and thirdly, then, just uh, in terms of the proposed NA uh, Agricultural Act, I mean, we've, we've took evidence this morning from, from various groups. Uh, I mean, I, I think by and large everybody has suggested something similar. Mm -hmm. But time scale, maybe there's maybe varying differences in terms of time scale, just given that there's so much uncertainty. Yeah. You know, different groups are saying, you know, we need to actually wait a, wait a while to see the impact of maybe the, 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 the asylum protocol and different things. So, I mean, from your point of view, what kind of a time scale would you be pursuing with regard to that? that? Yeah, so I'll start off with the uh, public goods one, and then maybe Phil will come in the ANC, and and then we'll all maybe chip in on on the time scale of, of what's appropriate. So uh, the concept of public goods is one that's kind of well tested and evidenced um, across the world, really. And it's the notion that if you put um, public money into something, um, that creates a public good. It's freely available to every, everyone. So in comparison to a private good where you pay for something um, at the shop and then you consume it, you're the only one that has it. So the opposite of public goods, where you put public money into something, it makes it freely available to everyone. So when, when um, the Agriculture Bill in the UK uh, in Westminster talks about public goods, environmental public goods in particular, um, it talks about things where you're, the public is funding interventions at farm level for certain environmental outcomes. Um, so that could be for the benefit of water quality, biodiversity um, and carbon storage, to name a few. Um, the best example probably of that at the minute in current policy is an agri-environment scheme, where um, a farmer voluntarily enters into an agri-environment scheme um, to deliver uh, certain options under contract uh, with the department um, with uh, over a five-year period with a certain outcome. So some of those could be um, tree planting, some of those could be action at farm level for threatened species. Um, <coughs> so that could be um, fencing along water courses, for example. So um, the notion that they are then getting public uh, money for that is um, good value for money from our point of view, because it means they're improving water quality um, for everybody. They're improving um, uh, the plight of certain species that are at risk um, for everyone. Um, and there's been a lot of debate uh, about whether food is a public good um, or not. Um, and in our understanding, and generally the, the accepted view, is that food is not a public good. Um, but food security and protecting the productive capacity of the land is a public good. Um, so there's quite a difference in nuance there. Um, but uh, yeah, so from a public good point of view, we, we would probably look to agri-environment schemes as a as a current example of of what that is currently delivering. 
I also just to add, if I may, Chair, just to add on that as well. It's one of the things that, that farmers, we believe, should be paid for delivering these things, and I think that can also contribute to their own resilience and their own sustainability, whereas, of course, if you're producing animals, whatever it is, livestock, which, of course, they will be doing as well, I mean, th th at least in this payment, they're guaranteed and it's steady, as opposed to the market fluctuations as well. Um, Philip, did you want to say something about that? In terms of the ANC payment, um, I suppose the criticisms that we would have about it in the past has been it hasn't had any conditionality attached to it. So farmers to get that payment, it's more based on where they are um, in terms of location. So they're, they're located in areas which face difficulties in terms of climate, for example, um, colder weather, it's, it's not as productive. And I think the, the idea there has been to try and try and counteract that and provide a payment because a lot of those farms in those areas are, are finding it very difficult to make a profit. But one of the other things with that is in these up and um, environments, the farming systems there are actually are, can be very beneficial for, for providing public goods. So, so much water comes from our, from our upland areas in terms of water quality. So is there a way that land can be managed that, that provides for that? In terms of carbon storage and mitigation, um, a lot of those, uh, those soils haven't been improved over a long period of time. So they've actually got a huge amounts of carbon stored in their soils. Um, in terms of biodiversity as well, our upland environments um, benefit species like curlew and lapwing, which are breeding waders, which have declined by up to 90% in Northern Ireland. So there's a range of public goods in these areas, and as John was alluding to before, we believe farmers should be incentivised to deliver them, and it should be targeted to those areas where, where they have that opportunity to do so. And I think with the ANC, um, it's, it hasn't necessarily recognised those benefits that have been provided from those landscapes and which farmers could provide. So we'd be looking at something that, that tailored in management, which manages those habitats. One of the other bits that we've been looking at is in terms of improving profitability in those landscapes and those farm businesses as well. And we've commissioned some research across the UK that looked at certain business practices which could improve profitability in those LFAs or ANC areas. And the general presumption has been that to, to improve profitability is to increase production in those landscapes. But whenever you increase production past the point of what your land can naturally produce, you have to start buying in inputs. So these areas are, are naturally not as productive as lower lower lying areas. So the, I suppose the presumption has been to to buy inputs and try and try and increase productivity and, and the production um, capability of it. But once you're eating, you're doing that, you're eating into your your profit margin um, and your costs start to outweigh what you're actually able to get from what you're producing. So. We found that less is more, and that if you manage with your stock in line with the natural carrying capacity of the land, it can improve profit margin and it, it can actually benefit the businesses there. So there's a range of things that we'd be looking at in a future policy to try and build the resilience and profitability of those systems. Just to add that to you, yeah, these areas tend to be the high nature value farms, and therefore we would like want to keep those people on land doing what they do best. You know, so it's, it's not a case of <coughs> saying, oh, no support for these people, just saying it should be maybe framed in a different way that helps them in their, in their current uh, way of operation. Jennifer, did you want to? Maybe just to add, if you have a look at the front of the Ag Bill, the financial purposes that are there for England, or the type of public good that they're obviously looking at, providing through the Agriculture Bill, so eight out of 12 <coughs> of those financial purposes are environmental linked, which will give you a better idea of the direction of travel for them. For ANC, certainly there is a big challenge for producers on the hill. It's a tough life. The margins and profitability isn't great. We have had a transition for single area payment towards a flat rate, which has rebalanced the distribution of funds to some degree. It's how you get a sustainable system and whether that is done through an ANC mechanism or some form of maybe agri-environment scheme with a top up where it's needed. Um, and there are other ways. So if you look at the farm business data book for Northern Ireland, you see there's a huge difference in gross margin from the lowest category to the highest category. So you have business development groups with CAFRI who are also working with a lot of those people to try and improve efficiency and productivity through other routes. But I think we'd all accept that we need the farmers to be farming in the hills. It's just a case of finding a suitable mechanism to enable that to happen. Just, just a bit on timing then of, of the potential bill. Um, so obviously the Agriculture Bill in Westminster is, is currently going through its legislative passage and um, is going through the bill committee stage at the minute. Um, 
its timing really runs from uh, January next year, um, the transition phase, right through until 2027. Um, and that gives time, I guess, and sends a signal to um, the industry that you know change is coming. And over that period, it gives them the chance to adjust their businesses if they need to. Um, in Wales, um, they have taken power in the bill and they've committed to a sunset clause, um, which, um, again, sends a signal to their uh, farm and industry that by 2024 they want to commit to writing legislation which will be primary legislation through the Welsh Assembly which will uh, be an agriculture bill for Wales um, and that will I guess provide the route map for where they're going. Um, there is no kind of such uh, as, as <coughs> John had said for Northern Ireland and um, we don't have a particular date in mind but sooner rather than Later, it probably we would say <coughs> on on that front. Um, I think you know one of the things that that the minister could potentially do um, after if this LCM goes through is uh, is is to commit to to saying you know at some point we will need some legislation in Northern Ireland um, because the the current uh, commitments that are in the agriculture bill will only go so far, and if if they they allow us to essentially maintain the status quo. Um, indefinitely, potentially, um, and we don't think that would be a good position for the agriculture industry or the environment. Um, so the, the status quo can't continue indefinitely, and um, it would be prudent of the, the minister to, to come forward with a potential uh, commitment. That would be helpful for the industry as well, because at the minute um, it's a very much a grey area as to what is potentially going to happen. But just some sort of certainty, I think, would be that I think farmers could do with certainty, but at the same time, is we can't. We need that as soon as possible, but at the same time, as if we rush, we, there's no point in rushing through. We need to get this right for all the different stakeholders. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry I have to leave or something to be a long way at five o'clock from here. Um, you mentioned in your briefing uh, a couple of payments, and I thought uh, you, you won't have, you won't own for a couple of payments. I think that. Not that you agree, I don't think you agreed to a couple of payments. Uh, there is a school of thought that small circular cows, cow men and sheep men, some sort of a couple of payments might have helped them stay in the business. And mm -hmm. um, so they, they do that in the Republic of Ireland and maybe possibly Scotland. I just wondered your view on that. I think they have both a couple of payments, both those are. I take that. Okay, so a couple of payments, yes. We'd be a bit worried about a couple of payments for a number of reasons. First, um, encourage people to increase their number of stock, which is different than maintaining what you have. And then if you're trying to reach net zero for carbon and drive ammonia levels down, that can cause difficulties later. So certainly we definitely want to see farmers farming. Again, it's back to a suitable mechanism for doing that. I would just uh, like to come in there as well. In terms of the purpose of coupled support, is it to, to provide the benefits to farm incomes? Because um, DERA undertook consultation on this in 2016 and engaged with, with the stakeholders about the potential to put through a, a coupled support scheme. And AFPE undertook some analysis to try and determine what the potential impact of that would be. And there would be a modest improvement in terms of production or a modest increase in terms of production by 2.1 per cent. But what the analysis was finding that that could potentially push down prices and farmers could then be receiving less in terms of, of return from what they have. Um, it puts downward pressure, so it would decrease what they, they, they sought so by about 3.4 per cent. I'm not so sure that of the situation because, as I'm aware, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm for or against myself, but it, it's something that may be looked at, okay? I mean, I'm not a suckler farmer myself, so it's not affecting me in the least. But um, suckler numbers are down maybe 10, 15, 20 percent, so I'm not so sure the, the reason, to, any reason that I was thinking of that they need a, suckler, or a couple of payment would be to try and maintain what's there and not, not to increase. Uh, and maybe there may be ways of doing that, I'm not so sure. You know? Well, you might be able to consider a payment for carbon farming where there are sustainable levels of grazing. It's once it goes beyond that that it starts to add to the current issues. So there may be other routes that 
can be considered. The Republic of Ireland are <coughs> having a look at what they are doing, not just in couple payments, but around common age grazing too. So they have a common age scheme which um, has had some challenges, and they are looking at options for the way forward for that scheme as well. Like, like all of these things, I guess it's it's not without risk. I guess, and we're we're entering into a new new territory with the uh, Northern Ireland Ireland Protocol coming into play as well. Um, and um, each if each of the countries around the UK starts determining policy that's different from England, Scotland, Wales, you could there could be a skew in the market. Um, and there's potential risk there. You know that there's a potential risk to the bottom um, for agriculture and environment uh, as to who can undercut who the best, and that's a situation we'd want to try and avoid. I'll say this before I leave. Most of the presentations we have received is, um, is uh, negotiations on world trade. This is the most danger of doing that, not 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 what we produce here. I don't think. Yeah, we accept that. Okay. Thank you. Really, all the best. Um, Claire. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, for your presentation, but also for your, your written piece as well. I think it's very, very detailed um, and a real, real help. Um, we've heard a lot today as well that um, new technologies coming forward could be the answer for a lot of sustainability within farming. You know, and as you rightly say, the, the bill produces um, a situation for Northern Ireland where we're maintaining the status quo, business as usual, and that in order to make that sort of fit with tackling climate or environmental commitments, that new technologies would be the answer. Would you agree, do you think? <laughs> Some potential role for technology in um, reducing um, emissions from slurry spreading, yeah. um, etc., ammonia scrubbers within houses. Um, so there is a, a potential role for technological fixes, um, but it, it would, we'd be hard pressed to say that technology alone is the silver bullet for um, improving um, the favour of many of our threatened habitats and species, which require kind of incentivised management um, on behalf of, of farmers and landowners. And the majority of the farmers are up for it, up for doing it. Uh, you know, to, you know, I guess they need to, some certainty as to whether they will be paid for doing it, and we think they should because they're going to be delivering a, an environmental public good. So there is, of course, there is a role for technology, but. Um, it would be a cross understanding of the situation to say that technology alone is going to solve those problems. Also, just to add, if, if I may, that a lot of the problems we have are really quite severe in, in terms of water quality, biodiversity loss, etc. So, as John alluded to, I'm not sure any technology is going to flick in tomorrow and everything's going to be okay. You know, so we have a lot of, a lot of ground to make up. Also, as well, technology certainly does have a part, and at the same time, as well, you know, we are. We're pr primarily a lot of small farmers out there, um, and a lot of technology and stuff will, will, you know, will cost and stuff as well. So it definitely has a part to play, but I don't think, unless there's something really revolutionary, how it's going to make the inroads that we need, given a lot of the information that said that we've been having the state of nature report about, you know, the, the state of our rivers, etc., and biodiversity. I'm not sure there's a there's a, a quick fix there through technology, but. Anything that helps has to be looked at. I think in terms of um, looking at some of the solutions to these problems as well, we need to look at the role that nature can play in doing that. Some of the best uh, solutions that we have are actually through managing some of our habitats well and looking after biodiversity. So in terms of increasing productivity, there's ways that you can manage the land and things that you can do which can actually benefit the farm business. Um, I'll use, again, a wider societal one in terms of climate change. Um, if we manage our semi-natural habitats in, a, in, in the right way, we can actually be drawing down carbon and storing carbon, and that has to have a key role to play in that mix of, of trying to address some of these issues. Provided a seamless link there to my next question, I suppose, as well. Uh, going to the notion of this public money for public goods, and what is this public goods? Your clean air, your clean water, your carbon storage, uh, and new ways of doing it. And uh, looking into that sort of nature farming, do we have much of that going on in Northern Ireland? There are certainly examples scattered all around. You have quite a number of farmers in agri environment schemes that will be managing designated sites. We would work with farmers who are providing cereals for Jordans and get a top up or a higher standard. So there are different examples and supply chains are starting to think about those issues more and more because they're all being asked to for their environmental credentials.
for their carbon neutrality, which is a big thing because of climate change. So it's still in its infancy, but it's definitely switching. There, yeah, there, there have been a range of externally funded projects um, by Indereg um, and agri-environment schemes, which um, facilitate farmers to work together at scale across landscapes um, for specific actions. So some of that could be on managing peatlands mm -hmm. at scale, which um, uh, would be good for uh, for carbon sequestration. Some of that could be managing habitats at scale for particular species of birds that are at risk. Um, so we have examples for farmers in County Down who have worked together at scale and improved the fortunes of Yellowhammer by 79% from baseline which is a great result. We've also got farmers in the uplands of the Antrim Hills in Gunwari who are essentially preventing the, the extinction of curlew in, in Northern Ireland. Um, curlew as a species has declined um, across uh, in Northern Ireland by 87% and in Ireland by 98%. So if we don't do something in the next 10 years, they're going to be extinct from Ireland altogether. And, that, and, that's the, and Ireland holds an important population for... Um, the, the curlew worldwide. So um, some some farmers are are working with ENGOs um, and off their own bat to help maintain those species um, altogether. At the same time as producing food. So it's not to say that they are um, farming nature, but they are farming with nature, and they are they are producing their private good, um, which they are selling on the market. Um, now, you know they you know it's our view they should probably be getting more from the market for those products because they are farming in a certain way. So we would like to see um, both a policy intervention which um, provides public goods uh, for farmers for farming in a certain way, but there, there also needs to be a market pull. And as Jennifer said, um, supply chains are starting to pick up on this and consumers are having a role in, in determining uh, whether uh, what products they're going to buy or not. So there needs to be both policy push factors and market pull factors, which will bring us to a place where the environment and landscape is improving. Um, but we need both of those or, or both of those incentives um, at play. There's also the opportunity, as John's been through some of the current scheme stuff, well, for farmers to cooperate and work together. And that would also be quite important, no matter how big your, your farm is, because one of the things that would help would be nature corridors, wildlife corridors, etc. You know, look at this thing at a landscape scale. So it could be an opportunity for farmers, you know, even if they think they haven't got a particular uh, angle in terms of farm, in terms of environmental improvement, where you're talking about wildlife corridors or tree plant, whatever it is, you know, if we can have several of them or more, many more cooperating together, then we're starting to get into the scheme that makes a real difference as well. Maybe if I could add, Peatlands is one win-win, I think, <coughs> if you look forward, it must got to be a priority from where we sit now. So we've got 12% of our land area is Peatlands, it locks up 53% of carbon, most of it is emitting carbon rather than sequestering carbon because it's not in appropriate condition status. So re that is a, a big priority for Northern Ireland in moving towards a net zero target. And I'm sure the IUCN has had a peatland strategy out to Northern Ireland. I'm sure we'll be <coughs> looking at one in the not too distant future. Scotland has just put in 200 million into peatland restoration under the 25 year plan. England has just put in 100 million. So it's obviously something that they're looking at to address their journey towards a net zero future. So what have we put in? We haven't got anything yet, bar interag. <laughs> I'm sure that will make its way to your committee at some time in the near future. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Morris? Thank you very much, Deputy uh, Chair. <laughs> uh, a lot of the things that I was going to ask, and thanks very much for your presentation, very, very interesting, from my point of view anyway. Uh, a young boy growing up, we had wetlands, we had peat bogs, we had shucks, for want of a better word, and we had rivers and burns. Now all we have is straight drains, and that has damaged an awful lot of land. So I would be fully in favour of legislation that provided financial incentives for more tree planting. Uh, and the re-establishment of the peat bogs is brilliant, by seeing around North Antrim area, uh, and also if we could re-establish wetlands. But most importantly, I think, and it's one that's always overlooked, is the importance of wildflowers, and the most important insect on the planet, the bee. If we could encourage farmers to plant more wildflowers along their hedgerows, etc., etc. And I remember climbing up hedgerows, now there are no hedgerows to climb up because they're all cut down. 
So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, sure is. Lord, I wish you well. I hope, hope it all works out because the planet's in a terrible state. We agree. Terrible state. <laughs> we agree. And certainly it, you're into habitat recreation there. And we have done a lot of it in Fermanagh, turning um, fields into species-rich meadows. And it has worked, despite all odds. We also are doing a piece of work at the minute with QUB on roadside verges. So it is important, and you need to join all that up through nature recovery networks. And you've maybe seen an environment bill in England, nature recovery networks is one of the clauses within that bill. And that's exactly the type of thing that it's looking at, how you do that on a landscape scale, and especially with climate when species are migrating. It's extremely important. So yes, we can fully agree. Just one point uh, to you, Deputy Chair, and, and that's you need buy-in from the rivers agency, because I think they're perhaps the greatest culprit for lifting stuff out and leaving everything straight lines and water rushes away from the uplands to the lowlands and then you have flooding. And can I just add, actually once again to agree with you on both points there and in terms of the things like you know if we talk about public money for public good people may automatically think well they have to give half my farm over to trees or or, or I don't have barn oils on my land so this doesn't apply to me but the sort of stuff that you're talking about you know I mean where drains have been literally you know, dug out and basically straight or the fact that like there's no wildfire but there are things. I mean, there are things that can be done. That would be surprises, you know, that most farms haven't something. It doesn't have to be as maybe as big a dramatic thing as perhaps people are thinking of. And if the opportunity is not there, there's always opportunity somewhere. <laughs> on a, from the wildflowers' point of view, just a quick stat in that we've lost 98% of our wildflower meadows since the 1930s. You know, which is a terrible state of affairs. Um, and all the benefits that they bring um, from from the insect point of view, um, but also then um, it's important not to look at this agriculture bill in isolation uh, from the environment bill, which will be coming next week. Um, but also then thinking about um, the environment strategy, which um, DERA are currently uh, have just finished a consultation on, which will hopefully come to the committee at some stage, um, because agriculture has a big role in uh, delivering for a lot of the commitments within that. So. Um, 75% of the land in Northern Ireland is farmed, you know, so it has a vital role in delivering for a lot of the targets that are going to be contained potentially within the Environment Bill or the forthcoming Environment Strategy. So um, it's good, I think, that the committee is looking at these uh, these different bills um, uh, over the next few weeks because hopefully you'll be able to kind of make the connections between both those important uh, pieces of legislation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, Hey, uh, John. Thanks, Chair. Um, some of what I was going to ask has been covered, but I wanted to uh, go back to, to, to the, the bill, if we can, for a moment. Uh, um, the, whether through that bill or through local policy, if there, if there is going forward more of an emphasis on productivity in agriculture rather than land use, could we, or would you agree generally that that is a negative for the environment? most of the time. Um, my, my perception of that is that there tends to be much less environmentally and, and usually economically, certainly locally economically, um, in terms of jobs, for example, for local area. Um, and I think that such such uh, policy tends to be skewed in favour of intensive farming, um, which aren't necessarily high numbers of jobs, just high numbers of animals most of the time. Um, therefore, minimum minimum benefit to local economy, minimum benefit to local environment. I'm very keen to hear your, your views on that. Um, and also, um, not totally unrelated, the bill that's coming forward pays scant reference to any organic farming uh, mechanisms or, or progress or plans. Um, keen to hear your views on that. It seems to be referenced in this almost as something for the future. That we might get to someday. We might do um, uh, with regard to Northern Ireland. Um, I believe that if we start having increasing numbers of conversations around traceability and quality, <coughs> then that, that organic argument comes into play much more strongly. So just mm -hmm. um, on the on the productivity. Um, well, productivity, sorry, versus profitability. I think so. When we responded to the DERA um, future agriculture strategy, we we commented quite a lot on that. That we should be looking at um, ensuring our um, agriculture industry is as profitable 
as possible as opposed to looking at it through a productivity lens. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not always it's not always right to say that necessarily productivity leads to degradation um, of the environment um, because some productivity can be done in a way that is more environmentally sensitive. Um, but our research would show through the State of Nature report that the, in the intensity of agriculture increasing has led to the declines that we're now seeing. So there is, a, there is obviously a sweet spot somewhere in there in the middle where um, the increasing levels of intensity um, have led to environmental destruction, but we need to find a path through where we're able to subsidise farming in a way that uh, makes productivity sustainable, um, and it's, it's, it's finding a way that incentivises um, the right type of action on farm. Um, on organics, um, I don't, don't know if I necessarily have an answer to that, but I could probably comment a bit on the current state of play. So organic farming at the minute is um, encouraged through the Rural Development Programme, um, the Environmental Farming Scheme. Um, but the uptake of that has been relatively low, and there's been relatively low budget attributed to that. Um, so yeah, there's obviously uh, more that could be done there from the organic sector point of view. I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything on the productivity front. I would just like to touch on the productivity side of things. So it's in, in the future bill, we're trying to get coherence and ensuring that any measures to improve productivity are done on a, on a sustainable natural resource base or actually contribute towards that. And there are examples of that happening and it's, it's about trying to find those other ways that we haven't found yet in terms of increasing productivity and also providing those public goods. Because I think in the past, the policy is, has almost been twin track and the two have been separated and I need to bring them together a little bit more. I think in terms of productivity as well, yes, it's been, as it has been mentioned by my colleague, for a lot of time it's been like more of, get more of, etc. In terms of, like we have problems in nitrate problems, ammonia, I think I believe he's touched on it on today as well. If we keep trying to develop the number of animals we have, and the number of animals we have, whatever it is, will affect prices, but also affects the environment as well. Like there hasn't really been, you know, how's one affect another? But if I, if I can just chair. During the time when the assembly was down, uh, to pay tribute to, to uh, DERA and to the civil servants, they brought a number of people together in a number of working groups. They didn't lead it, they just facilitated it. Um, and they, we had, for example, to come up with priorities for Northern Ireland post-Brexit. And it was four working groups. One was fisheries, one was rural society, one was environment, and one was trade and agriculture. Now, I. All I know at that time was we all worked, and so everyone around the table was all represented. We, the environmentalists, were there with the processors as well, with the meat exporters as well, with the farmers' organisation, etc. And we agreed a template for what we'd all like agriculture to look like in the future. Now I'm not going to quote that verse because I can't remember that much about it, except for the fact that I think all of us sitting around the table thought, yeah, we can live with that. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'm not saying that answers the question as regards, because it had to look at, I do remember the three, there was productivity, and how, how we can increase productivity but in a sustainable way, how we could look at improving resilience of the farmers and the farming industry, and of course the third was, was environmental sustainability, and they were the three areas that that was built around. So I'm not saying that it is not outdated or maybe needs to be updated or reviewed, but it might actually be a good starting point to think if we're looking at a future agricultural bill, well, how does that sit now with what we agreed back in, I'm going to guess, 2017, 2018. So there was a, a separate environmental one done, a separate fisheries one done, and I think there was a separate rural society one done, and there definitely was an agricultural one. But each group had representatives on it from the other, is what I'm saying. So it, so those those areas we all knew at the time, they had to be looked at, and had to be integrated better. And if it can be underpinned by sustainability, productivity, um, add value rather than have a negative value. So if you take, for example, phosphorus and nutrient management planning, if you follow, if you do your soil analysis, you follow your nutrient management plan, you can have the same or more productivity of less fertilizer. So it's finding the tools that help the industry move on through precision farming type techniques. And the Netherlands and other countries are all looking at the same approach. It's not always about piling in more animals. If you can increase your calving index on, a, on a, an area of upland, then you need less stock to get the same productivity, productivity per hectare. 
So it's just about how you approach that issue and how you make it work for both the environment and the industry. Thank you. Right, um, thank you, John. I suppose just before we conclude, um, I just want to get your assessment of the see the, the current um, mechanism we have here in terms of farm payments. You know, we have the based on the area that you farm, um, the the VPS basic payment scheme, and thirty percent is for grading, and you have to abide by a number of uh, cross compliance measures and. Fundamentally, farmers are incentivised to keep their land good agriculture and very mental condition. What's your assessment of the current scheme? You know, is it would you be content that that is delivering on environmental outcomes, or what's your view on it? I start viewing. Um, just some general comments. Um, I, I don't think if, I don't think the I think one of the officials are on presented said is the current system then to do with the cap related type stuff was basically out, outdated and an old an old system an old framework. Um, I don't think it works well because, as I said, it's hard to find anyone who's happy with it. Um, and sometimes, if not everybody's happy, well then it can be well maybe there's something in the middle we can agree on. But in this time, I would say is that in terms of how support and stuff is given, um, I don't think it works well. I think in terms of the 30% for of for greening, I think the greening measures apply to a very small number of farmers. I could be wrong. Maybe six farmers in Northern Ireland. Um, have to take measures to get the greening payment. Is that right? I think, and and others, you know. So it doesn't. The f the funding is there, but you don't actually have to do a lot for it in terms of the greening payment. I think permanent grass is is, is one of the things that qualifies for that at the moment. Uh, in terms of cross compliance, um, because of as I said, biodiversity loss, the, c the condition of our soils and everything else, and it's a system that I know the farmers are not happy about. Um, and how it's implemented and how it's operated, etc. And I would accept that. And I know the environmentalists, by and large, aren't happy with it either. So um, that's why we'd be a bit concerned in terms of business as usual. You know what I mean? As in letting that letting that drift. If you can put it that way. Yeah, I think I think at the macro level, in terms of um, value for money for the public. So public fund the subsidy uh, for the agriculture industry to produce food, which they do uh, really well, but. Inevitably, because of the system and the way it's set up, it produces um, environmental degradation. Then um, the farmer produces food, which is sold um, to the public via private good, which the public pay for as well. So they've paid twice, and then they pay a third time for um, the environmental degradation uh, for government to clean that up or to put action in place. Um, to clean that up. So, from a value for money point of view, um, you know, it would be hard to argue that it's good value for money for the public. Um, and as Sean said, you know, a lot of the research would show that um, the current cross compliance system is not necessarily as effective as it could be. Even the EU Court of, Court of Auditors would say that in their most recent report, that um, it's not delivering um, to its full potential. Um, although it is a lot of kind of uh, administration for the individual farmer and farm groups um, to have to do, um, it delivers very little benefit. From an environmental point of view, but to be fair to the farmers as well, also in their case, they're delivering within the system that's set there for them, yeah. uh, and that's why this is a good opportunity to set a, a better system that that favours everyone. I think if you're looking at, at outcomes and what the cap and BPS is trying to achieve in terms of supporting farm incomes and in terms of trying to um, maintain the environment, all of those things, if you test them against the outcomes which are set for the basic payment. It's not really delivering on them. Um, farm incomes have, have declined. Environmental quality has declined. It's not working, and there's an opportunity to, to look at how we deliver those outcomes in a, in a smart way that, that provides that benefit. Uh, one of the other features of the bill is Clause 34, which looks at uh, agricultural holdings. and Those are a group. Uh, I've done a report there. It was last year. An extra working group on sustainable land management that concluded that the insecurity of the 11 month tendencies. Uh, wasn't good in terms of environmental performance. What, what would be your view on terms of the Conacre system, which is typically like an 11 months rental um, arrangement here? Would, would you have any view on 
Um, should there be a, a longer term, or what, what the position on that? We agree. Uh, Conacher system doesn't really work for anybody because no one then wants to invest their time or money in the land, and you also mm. can't access agri environment schemes unless you have a five year agreement. So it automatically rules out some people from moving in that direction. And if we want to change things, because you're in the middle of a climate and ecological emergency, we need to do something differently. And we need more money spent to deliver environmental outcomes, which can improve the farming resilience at the same time if we get the design of that correct. And at the minute, only a small percentage of the overall budget is spent on environmental outcomes and agri-environment. So you have 325 million, something like that. And 295 of that is on single area payment. The rest is on agri-environment and rural development. And if you take CMS in the last two years, so it's 38 million that has been committed under CMS, another tranche about to go out. So it's how you rebalance that equation for Northern Ireland PLC. Well, thank you very much. That's your view on that there. So, um, no members have indicated that they want to uh, ask a more question. So, I'd like to thank you very much for coming before the committee here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, folks, do members of any other business wish to raise? Okay, one of four members. The next meeting is on Thursday, 27 of February. At 9:30 a.m. in room three. Oops, sorry, sorry, 10 10 a.m. in room 30. And this will be another um, all day event. So bring your flasks. <laughs>
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.